going to get stuck into it. Um, but firstly, before we get to the questions, I think we do... I just wanted to chat about nationals. And Have we started? Yeah, we're on. That was it. Yeah. You didn't, you didn't introduce me or anything. No, no intro. Just straight in. Straight in. Right. Straight in. So nationals, right. Luke Plapp right. with the win. Uh, one talking point about this was about how, <laughs> how talented he is because... If you looked at his season last year for his run, and I think a lot of people think, oh, yeah, Luke, like the winner of Nationals, probably just done the most work, hardest training and that sort of thing. But he was doing the those international track events at the end of October. Then he would have... That was the end of his season. So then he would have had some sort of break off-season. So let's say... Let's say a week... Well, let's say, you know, most pros would probably have three or four weeks, but let's say he had two weeks off. That means he's really only had two months of preparation for nationals you would think after the after his off season uh, and then to come out and have a ride like that after really probably only eight weeks of training is insane um, and kind of goes to show that you know there are there's probably 80 guys in that race that quote unquote trained harder or would have done more training than him but it kind of goes to show talent and prepping smart like you you, he's he's not making mistakes in his prep there like that's very smart targeted approach he would have had to get that sort of fitness but really no one else in that race stood a chance Uh, domination and I think it's it's the unfortunate I think a lot of people when someone wins nationals it's like you know big pats on the back you know you trained really hard and well deserved which it is well deserved not to take away from it but it's kind of a bit of a reality check for the rest of the field um, when you kind of look at, like, guys would have been doing three, four, five-month preps for this. Like, there'd be people in July going, I'm targeting nationals, and they'd be planning it that far out. And to get a, you know, that's why these guys are pro. They come out, and they got two months to get fit, and they go and do it. And I think it's, <laughs> it's just And that, crazy. that's, like, not you saying, like, it was easy for him or something like that. It's, it's more that, like, the... The narrative of like, oh, you know, well deserved, you know, as if he out trained other people or yeah. outworked other people. Because I mean, you know, we our guys, even like guys that Jesse coaches who are doing that race, they trained for months for that event, like you said. So I don't know, for me, a little bit of it, like the writing was a little bit on the wall last last year. When he did his two or three lap solo burst, you could kind of see that it's there yeah. for him. He just had to time it. <laughs> like, and yeah, like you said, it wasn't close in the end, was it? No, like, it wasn't he's just... close. And I just, I find it, it blows my mind that he can condense such a specific prep. Mm. Like he's doing the Madison on the track at the end of October. Go on his Instagram and go back to October. He's on the track racing. Essentially two months later, he's out doing a five hour road race in the heat in, in Australia. It's like, yeah. But even no like, one yeah. can do that. No. Like, wh- yeah, can I throw? Can I throw? Yes. So, so Luke was on Nero in the very beginning, and when he was a kid, and you could like he was fully like laser focused at that moment for every single event. So, you know, I think that's the Grampians in front. That's cool. Sorry, yeah. we're driving to Adelaide, by the way. Driving to ADL. All right. First question. Uh, sort by let's go right to the bottom thanks for you guys for asking questions so quick I kind of forgot to do the video yesterday and I was like oh, I hope we get questions so we can answer really? first one Fat Duck 82 one 6 hour ride two 3 hour rides or three 2 hour rides which will give you the best training benefit I'm guessing this is in a week um, okay we can rule out one 6 hour ride if we're doing this yeah if we're doing this in a week one, one ride a week you're going to lose fitness in the 5 days in between it's not going to work. Two three-hour rides or three two-hour rides? Um, depends what you were prepping for. I'd say maybe maybe 10% of the time, two three-hour rides would be good. Like if you, if you were doing a longer road race, there are some situations where a two three-hour rides in a week would be better. But I think for pretty much, yeah, for nine out of 10 scenarios, I'd say three two-hour rides is going to be best. Um, then you, yeah, then you're only having w- sort of one day off 
in between sessions. And you get to ride your mic more. Yeah. Way better. Exactly. Um, yeah, that's a, uh, that's a pretty easy one. I'd go three two-hour rides. It was me. Next one. It's winter in the UK and I don't and I don't race, but like long days with lots of climbing. Okay. okay. Am I best off doing the intensity now and riding in the summer? And running in the summer or base miles now? Oh, okay. So it's winter. So it's winter in the UK and another is sort of saying... Should I do my base training, which is typically higher volume, even though the weather sucks? Mm. Or should I do more intensity? And then and then do the longer Ks uh, in, the, in the summer? Uh, I don't really... In the winter... It's winter in the UK and I don't race, but like long days. Do, do them... Uh, I don't think they need to be one or the other. Like, obviously, you do, do your long days in summer when the weather's good, for sure. And if you don't want to do that in winter now, like at the moment, I would say don't, don't force yourself to do it. Find a, find a different way of um, preparing yourself for summer that doesn't involve doing massive long rides in the bad weather. Like, just condense it, condense it down into... Um, do more sweet spot stuff or do do more regular sessions. Keep the sessions shorter but train more regularly um, throughout the week. Just have less days off to get that volume in without having to spend more hours on the bike. Yeah, I don't... Yeah. Am I best off doing the intensity now and riding in the summer or base miles now? Yeah, I, that doesn't... They don't, I don't need to be... I don't think you need to be that polarised, yeah, does it? I, I mean... Yeah. Yeah, you don't you don't need to be one or the other. No. You can mix mix them both. Yeah, I, yeah, I think we'll leave that one there. Uh, what is the best way in terms of diet and training to lose weight while my t- maintaining power and fitness? The eternal um, million dollar question, my friend. Answered. Someone asked this pretty much exact question in the last one. Uh, same thing. Always fuel your training so that your power is good and you train well. So carbohydrates before, during, and after training and then eat a calorie deficit and eat enough protein. I had to answer this in the last one. Uh, yeah. Staying, it's pretty simple. Staying, not losing power involves training well on the bike to maintain your fitness. So that's always a constant. And then losing weight is just about eating less or eating better food after that. I don't, yeah, that's it. There's no, there's no other... There's nothing else I can say. There's no other trick to that that I could sort of say. The only trick that I can add is fueling yourself on the bike will reduce your cravings after riding. That's the only sort of constant in my life when it comes to any sort of weight management is to avoid those. I I open the pantry and I have to eat 12 packs of biscuits because I didn't fuel myself on the ride. Is, this is there a light? That, there's no light. No, okay. so this is a stitch up with the RX100. Fingers crossed. Actually, give me... Sorry, guys. Give me one second just to make sure this is recording. Because you wouldn't want to edit this or anything. No, God, no. Uh, focus cancel. Where's the recording? Don't hit focus cancel. Don't hit it? God, no. That means it'll just focus on one spot and not your face. Okay, it's recording. Okay. Make sure focus cancel is not on. Yeah, nice. Okay, uh, so moving on. How did you find the Fondo? Great, you guys wrote it. Uh, thanks, Adam. Um, it was really hard. It's really hard. Um, it was, I don't really, I mean, Chris said this a few times, but it's not really a Fondo. It's kind of like a road race. Like, guys are, you know, the lap times we were doing up the climb are fast. And guys were sort of attack. like almost, guys were attacking. It's sort of, yeah, that was, it was brutal. Um, can, can I say something? Yeah. That was not a Fondo. It's not. Okay, a Fondo is, and I'm not going to even go at it, but a Fondo is like the MS Gong ride or something where everyone rolls out and, you know, you take a few selfies and have a chat. How you been going? We did five laps of the Mount Bunny on course. Uh, they were the fastest, well, they were as fast as any five laps I've done in the Elite Road Race. And it was on. I was dropped by the three top guys in 
our, our race on the first lap. We then spent the rest of it like just attacking and chasing and holy hell. It was awesome. It's the best bike race. Well, it's the first bike race I've done since Grafton last year, but it was, it was a race and it should be a race. And I'd love to see them actually, when I say them, I mean, I was cycling like fully promoing that because like, what a better way to get more people down to watch the, um, the nationals than get them to do a, a bike race the day before on the same course. Yeah, you could totally. I mean, it works as a fondo, but you could also, yeah, they could easily run that as a graded, a graded scratch race. Um, so the other thing, great that you guys rode it. I Thanks for that, because there were definitely people kind of scoffing that two Nero Continental riders were lining up in the fondo, but um, I don't know, it's better. If we didn't do that, we wouldn't have done anything because we weren't going to enter the elite race. My CTL at the moment is like 50, so I'm not going to line up for the elites. So I thought, yeah, may as well enter and get a ride in and get to ride the course. Um, even though obviously it would have rubbed some people the wrong way. And look at it. I think Chris got ninth and I got 15th. It's not like we went out and won the thing. So, um, yeah, I'm it, glad to do it. I, I, I would, the only thing I'll disagree with there is every single person in my wave was like, oh, cool, awesome. Like, everyone was super positive, like, I have to say. Yeah. Was... Oh, I was talking more about, like, some of the teams, some of the other teams oh, on the right. sideline yeah. would have been like, oh, fucking yeah. Nero, Nero yeah. doing the Fondo. But they're like, at, yeah. this, at this point, like, we do all the, the taps and the mudgy classics and stuff, like, you know, and we do that because, no, there's lots of reasons we do that. Yeah. So I'm, we're well used to being laughed at. Oh, it's not, stuff. yeah, it's not, not definitely not going to stop <laughs> us. It's just more of a comment. Um, yeah, actually it makes me more inclined to do it because I, I love pissing people off. Um, how can I improve my cornering skills? Descending or at a crit when the pace is high? I can't hold the wheel. I'm 185, running 175 cranks, but I see others at the same height pedal through the corners. Um, okay, so just to cover the pedaling through the corners thing. Yeah, the pedaling through the corners is a hard one because you just have to... You don't know where the limit is of pedaling through the corners until you do it and clip your pedal. So. But the good thing is if people are pedaling through the corners, you probably can too. So just just pedal through the corners, essentially. Um, yeah, cornering skills, it's, this is quite a specific one. Um, there's, that, there's that whole thing of you should sort of slightly back off the wheel earlier before you hit the corner and then do a couple of pedal strokes before you enter so you're coming in with a bit more momentum so you can kind of come onto the wheel in front as you go through the corner and, and exit on the wheel, that sort of principle I find works. I'm not going to spend 10 minutes explaining that in more detail. Um, that's pretty good. But uh, essentially, it's just edging, pushing the envelope in terms of your confidence and your what your perceived risk taking. Slowly push it forward. Like don't. You just have to. It's, there's no. There's not really any secret to it. You just have to be a bit more ballsy and keep pushing that limit that you're comfortable with. Um, I don't have any other specific skill technique thing to really say. You just, just toughen up, go faster. Pretend someone's got a gun to your head and it's telling you to corner faster. What are you going to do? Like, it essentially comes down to it. Um, look, just, just look through the corner is, is the only skill thing I can sort of throw into it. Like, look for where you want to exit the corner, not you know, at the rider in front of you or at the obstacle on the ground, just look to, to that exit point in the corner. And like Jesse said, it's it's pretty simple. It comes it comes down to the speed. You're getting dropped in the corner because you're not going into the corner as fast as the person in front of you. So it's just purely comes down to your entry speed into the corner, which you just need to ramp up with confidence. Yeah. But it, even if you get all the skills right, yeah. It's always going to be scary cornering faster. So just toughen up and do it. Because even though you could listen to 100 different people give 100 different tips, essentially you're just going to have to be a bit braver and go faster. That's, that's just how it is. So there's plenty of riders that are, don't have skill, but they just corner quick because they just got balls. So just, if you want to be good, just and go did, faster. And did he put, he put like his height or something? 185 in? centimetres like, and crank That length. stuff doesn't matter, mate. Yeah. Just... Like, at some point, you've just got to Bend go your elbows. It. <laughs> it's like... Yeah. 
What do you think of the growing Chinese direct-to-consumer bike market? Wind space, fast boards, etc. I'm thinking my dream bikes are both the SLC 2.0 and the Windspace T1500 with all their wheel sets. Well, I think this is, well, I think it's big. It's gonna, I think it'll take over. I've said in the past, the time, when it comes to the point where you can order a fully built bike direct from China, I think that'll, that'll make a massive change. I think the big concern or the big holdback people have at the moment is it's annoying buying a, a frame set because then you're having to buy a group set and then you're buying bo different bottom brackets for the cranks and then you're taking it to a bike shop and the, the cost adds up. So by the time, you know, the frame sets are cheap, but by the time you've factored in the mechanic to build it and the, the price of a group set when you're buying it on its own compared to the, you know, the price that a bike brand buys at OEM and builds it up, you, you end up paying a bit more. So when these, if Windspace can source group sets and sell complete builds, I think that'll be a, yeah, that'll be a big change. Because the shipping's already pretty good um, from China. So I don't think the shipping's an issue. It's just that it's a pain in the ass when you buy a frame set, you gotta build it up. So I'm all for it. I think full, full steam ahead. Um, yeah. Go for it. What do you reckon, Chris? What do I reckon? It's, it's, look, this is, I don't know how many people have seen my set of comments on the, the, the frame world at the moment, but yeah, I, I think this is almost one of the solutions for what's hap happened in the bike industry at the moment. I mean, as you probably know, the bike industry is broken. You can't even get a chain, let alone a bike, half the time. And this direct-to-consumer stuff is going to be one of our ways out of it. Quality is there. Um, for I, I would not regard Windspace particularly as a, like... Um, secondary brand anymore like it's pretty well known it's mm. and as far as the manufacturing the frame of it goes it's 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 good stuff um so yeah i i, I think you're i think you're in a really good position i think consumers are going to be in a really good position to go that route uh, in the future and hopefully it puts the, the big brands under a bit of pressure mm. i think you've already seen that with wheels i mean the fast sports wheels are, are great and you've seen like back in the day you know you'd you, you'd pay th Three or four grand for a brand name wheel set. Yeah. I think the prices already have dropped from some yeah. of the name brands anyway. Yeah. Uh, the, so, just the only thing, the last thing I'll quickly say on that is so the big difference between components, big difference between components and frames, right, is that the frame, the frame stuff, you're in a lot better place because really all that tech is shared between all, the, all those different frame guys, right? So, you're not going to get into that many problems. The things with components, that's still pretty locked down between the four or five main component brands. So, yeah, I would... Um, so some of that sort of micro-shift yeah. stuff is a bit slop, isn't it? It's like, kind of works, but it's usually lower level. Yeah. Yeah. Because I've seen... I have looked up some of the reviews of some of those, those budget, like, sort of AliExpress group sets, and they're not great. There's always a little bit that's like, oh, this is a bit not crap. Yet. Um, Shimano or Campy? Is that a question? Question, yeah. Uh, uh, we only yeah. use Shimano, uh, we only use Camp. well I've only used Campy Mechanical. So, at the moment I'm saying Shimano, but I would really have loved to have used Campy EPS. Um, so I could give a full answer, so I'd say Shimano. Campy EPS is the best groups that I've ever used, 100%, definitely. Um, but, it was really hard to get parts. It was really hard to get parts. And so, yeah. And then again, it's probably just as hard to get Shimano parts at the moment. So, yeah, I don't know. Um, the problem with Campy as well, you then got to, like, if you go to Campy, you got to buy a different chain tool because yeah. you've got to pin the chains. You then, your cassettes are all different. Like, it's, I feel like once you go Campy, you, you kind of got to stick with it. So, yeah, I wouldn't just... If you were like, oh, you know, Campy might be nice, I might just buy a Campy bike and try it out, I would think See, did you, really, did you like the thumb shifting? Yeah, I like See, that. I really liked the thumb, the yeah, thumb shifting. I like the thumb shifting. Um, Dump, yeah, the... Doof, doof, doof. I, do, like, yeah. I did really like that. That's really um, good. Yeah. I will say, I will say that I haven't ridden for a long time Shimano Mechanical. But I do see it every now and again and go, geez, that's, that is nice. Like, just DI2, sorry, 
Durace Mechanical, for me, is is really nice group set. Light as hell, too. Yeah. For electronic. Anyway, let's... <laughs> Does Chris miss Dublin? Ooh. Uh, don't miss the weather, but yes, I do miss... We were very much going to live there. We were 100%. Um, that was the way the rest of our life was going to be. But as you probably know, if you are Irish, that, that epping recession pretty much punted a lot of people out of the country and we took the opportunity to come back to Australia at that point. Um, I miss like the... I actually think Adelaide's a similar size to Dublin. I miss that kind of real close knit feeling that you get. Like you just see some, like you'd be in a different suburb or something, but you just see someone you know and like meet up with them and chat. There's that real community atmosphere to the whole place. Um, yeah, hopefully, hopefully get back there this year. Okay, quick, quick fire, a couple more. What's your favourite route in and around Dublin? Oh, uh, Sally Gap. So down to. Um, down to uh, Enniskillen, uh, up to Sally Gap, and <laughs> back uh, into Dublin via the um, military road. Right. Or if I'm feeling good, down to Wicklow Gap to see the Dragon Lady Owen. Wicklow Gap, best climb in the area. And then how does how does Dublin compare to Sydney for cycling? So overall. Um, so Dublin. Had the access to the Wicklow Mountains was fantastic, like 20 minutes, a bit like Adelaide, 20 minutes you're in the mountains, awesome. The only problem was that three quarters of the year it was pouring with rain and you just couldn't do that. Or if you did, you just had to sort of toughen up and ride in the wet, which is what you did. But yeah, Sydney is, it's a like different beast. It's a big city, but the climate's amazing. So you can ride 12 months of the year. And I will quickly say this, the racing, the racing access we have in Sydney is just the best. I didn't find that in Dublin. It was really hard to get into. It was like real closed shop. You had to do like all these intro rides with clubs before they even let you join the club. It wasn't, um, yeah, it actually wasn't that um, uh, welcoming. Yeah. Okay. So. Um. Will we ever see Jesse in Ireland? Um, my dad's actually Irish, full thick Irish accent from northern. Yeah, he's Ireland. north. He's from the north. From the north. So, so will I ever go to? I. I don't have any plans to go there. My dad never really goes back, so uh, probably, maybe not anytime soon. I wouldn't think. Are you guys competitive with each other regarding your channels? Uh, yeah, I'm gunning for Chris. I'm getting Chris yeah, isn't competitive. Way. You can probably. I'm uploading more than Chris is now. So, yeah. I mean, I am. I don't think Chris is. Um, and Chris is kind of like, wants to do stuff to promote the team and, and that sort of thing. I'm just like, what do people, what's, what's hot? What do people what, want to watch? What's Chris from what's Saddle Hay? Yeah. yeah. It's like, um, yeah. Uh, the two best cycling channels on YouTube, in my opinion. Thanks, James. Very nice. Kelly's motos and he's team. no chance of going to Ireland. Can I just quickly say this? The reason why, like, his he's got two ideas of a holiday. One is bike, this type thing. Number two is sitting on a beach in Bali. They are literally his two ideas of a holiday. So no, he's not going to Ireland. Helly's motos and team cars. What's the effect on the draft for riders in the peloton with these elements in play? I've seen a bit of chat. People thinking helicopters. So, no, helicopters don't impact. They're, they're flying so high above the race, you wouldn't even know they're there. Motos, uh, a, yeah, a bit. Like, especially you see riders, if they're doing like a solo break, they'll generally get a bit of love from the motorbike in front. That definitely impacts racing. Um, not really domestically, because we don't have that good coverage with that many motos, but pro racing, 100%. Um, motos impact the race. But I, I, I would actually say I kind of like it. Mm. It's kind of it's like a, it's, of it's, it's like a gamesmanship. Mm. It's like if I can get off the front, get a bit of love from the moto around a couple of corners, that's kind of funny. Like it's part mm. of the, you know, it's like good on you if you manage to game the system Agreed. that way. I'm, I'm, I don't have a problem with it. And team cars, um, yeah, like a lot of the time riders will get dropped and come back because the convoy is so long. Um, 
especially in, in some of the UCI races, teams are allowed to have two team cars. And let's say you've got 12 riders, 12, let's say you've got 12 teams in a race, you might have 24 convoy cars behind, which is a huge thing. So if you get dropped, you've got a lot of room to come back. So team cars definitely affect the race. Um, you saw the commissaires at, like at Nationals, for example, did a pretty good job of um, stopping the team cars from coming forward when riders were dropped to minimize the chance that riders could use the convoy cars to get back. Um, so yeah. They, we'll, they do, do try and yeah, mitigate we'll, that. We'll explain that in the Nationals vlog um, that we'll, we'll get up this week because it's called barricading and it's it's like this whole other game that goes on in the convoy, which we learned yeah. a lot about at Nationals because it was like the first time we'd done that. Mm. But um, just as a general rule in Australia and domestic stuff, they are right on that. Like it's pretty, you don't get much benefit. At all. It's, it's usually as well, I mean, on a hilly course, it doesn't matter too much because if someone's dropped and they just manage to get back on, you know, maybe a team car gives them a hand, they're going to get dropped the next time you go up the climb anyway, so it's not a big deal. It is a problem on flat races though, because obviously if the team car helps you come back in a flat race and then you can stick in there and contribute for your team, that's definitely an issue. Uh, but I find it's, it is a circus back in the team cars, like it's, you see some of the riders coming back on and it is, people wouldn't believe the the, the risks that the riders are going through to get back on it's it's actually scary it's it's he scarier drove. watching for yeah. the in it's scarier watching when you're in the moment you got the adrenaline rush on the bike you don't realize the risk you take until you're in the car and you're looking at these oh yeah it's sketch um, but it's part of racing i think it's cool yeah it's all part of the the yeah. madness of what is cycling bike racing any advice on how to learn your limits cornering without sliding out and crashing? Uh, kind of, kind of answered that one previously. Can you talk about how your FTP has developed over time from when you were beginning to now? Hmm. Uh, I'll go first because I kind of remember I got it in my head. So when I, I switched over from rowing in sort of 2014, I would say, and I was heavier then, so I was probably probably between 80 and 85 kilos. And I... Said to chat, oh, mute this, mute. So bah, 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 bah. <laughs> I didn't even have to chase them out the door. They were ready before me. Oh, sent a face um, emoji. When I started, yeah, so when I, I was between 80, 85 kilos, and I think my first sort of threshold when I was first getting a pound meter was between 320 and 330 watts, which is quite high, but I was also quite heavy. Um, so what's per kilo, that's not amazing. Still pretty solid, obviously. Um, and then I was sort of, I just stepped up from there over, progressively over the years, sort of 360, you know, 370, 380, I was going pretty well. Uh, that was probably 2016, 20, yeah, 2016. Then in 2017, 2018, I was up sort of 400-ish when I was training essentially full-time, 400 watts at maybe 76 kilos was sort of 76 yeah 75 76 kilos 400 watts was probably the best i've ever been so that took me uh what's that four years and that's that's my progression uh chris what about you so mine's a bit funnier because uh i didn't have a power meter on my bike until i'd been racing in the nrs for almost two years so by the time I actually put a power meter on, I was potentially already had done my best stuff. I don't know. Mm. Um, yeah, so like I did two tour of Tasmanias, no power meters. Um, managed to climb in the front group, and one of those ones. No idea what wattage that was. Um, so I didn't put a power meter on my bike until uh, 2016. Uh, it was Tour Down Under, 2016, and uh, yeah, so my kind of FTP has pretty much always been from then around 330. My weight has dropped from about 65 to 62 and a bit, so you know, watts per kilo has kind of gone up, but the raw power from that has particularly changed. I would say it's interesting for you though, because you, know, you, you say your FTP is around 330, and not to be a dick, but if you look at any, the hardest crit you've done mm. for an hour, 
you rarely get above 320 norm. Yeah. So I think for Chris, it's put him up a climb in good shape. He can do some big watts per kilo. But as a smaller rider, it's a lot harder for you to hit good numbers in racing. Whereas I will go to a race yep. and I'll hit like PB numbers at Heffron, for example. Um, no chance. Which I'll is a bit that. different for Chris. No so it's kind of interesting there in terms of you know how, how the FTP is applied. And the only other thing like I'd say is like my my hour power is much closer to my 20 minute power than yours as well. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like where and like my even shorter power than that is again much closer to my longer powers just because it's the, the whole window kind of closes yeah, it feels like down. everything you do is like yeah. three yeah, yeah that sort of yep. around that whether that's three hours or ten yep. minutes 100% it's like like uh, that race the Fondo we did I normalised 300 for that entire race which isn't that far from like what my like ten minute yeah. power is do you know so mm. anyway yeah. uh, advice for owning a bike in a small apartment bike washing maintenance etc uh, I actually do want to do a specific video on this because, mm. okay, quick, do it quickly. I use a wax-based lubricant on my chain. So I do a full, when I get a new chain, full degrease, and then I use a wax-based lube. So I never actually degrease my chain. I just dry rag and then reapply the thing. So I, I never have to actually clean the dirty bits of the bike. And then to actually clean my bike, I just it's just a frame and wheel clean, essentially with just some spray and wipe and some paper towels. So, living in an apartment, that's what works for me. I will, I do want to do a video on it because it is, it's worked really well for me. Chris, you're a bit, Chris, you like cleaning your bike. It's like a part of the whole. Yeah, um, I do. Yeah, I've actually gone back off wax trains at the moment. Too, um, too clean. Too clean, <laughs> too clean. Uh, advice for, uh, can you get away with an air compressor in an apartment? Uh, a bit loud, yeah. expensive. Um, no, I'm no good. See, I'm a, <laughs> I'm a take. I washed my bike yesterday evening. Didn't wash his, because um, I just love it. Get the bike out the back. Got it in the car park at the hotel and washed it down. Beautiful. Makes me feel so. It's so good. weird. That's like the. I, it's the worst part of cycling is cleaning the bike. Yeah. Still uh, see a bit of grit in the in the fingernails. <laughs> it's beautiful. Yeah. Sorry, not much on that really. But keep an eye out. I'll do a video. What on about that. storage and? Because there's some really good storage stuff now, isn't there, for um, in the apartments? Anyway. I don't know. I think okay. it's a balcony. Uh, uh, what are some cycling-specific gym exercises you would you recommend? I've done a whole gym... Two, a couple of weeks ago, I did a whole gym session video. Uh, yeah, uh, just anything that involves um, knee extension, hip extension. Do you, do you prefer single leg or both leg? Um... Both. There is a lot of benefit in doing single leg stuff. So yeah. definitely include some single, single leg. leg work. Yeah. Definitely. Um, but yeah, well, any yeah, nothing too specific there. What you eat in the day of training? Calories, carbs, slash fat, slash protein. Uh, not to be rude, I'm going to skip that one. I kind of yeah. Eating? We don't eat. What you eat in a day? Just oh, fast. Done, yeah. Just we just just sugar. Sugar. That's all I eat. Sugar. Sugar and avocado. Just, I swear people think that's actually all. Probably. I, sh I should read. I've got to redo that video actually. That's that was people's. terrible. That was. That was, it was I did a whole bloody 10 minute or oh, 15 minute nutrition breakdown of that day. You can't. That's what, what was terrible about it. So here's, here's my thing with it, right? Like. Did you watch the nutrition breakdown video? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, okay. you hit all the marks. All right. No issue with that. Okay. It's. <laughs> sorry. But it's just that, like, if you're going to eat all that sugar, why not have something yummy, like instead of that sugar? Do you know? Well, it's full. I don't have any more room. I, was... I, I just find that's such a waste of what could have been yummy food was just yep. some sugar. Yep. That's my that's my criticism. That's I love fair food. Fair enough. So. Yeah. I have noticed that as well. Like you, mm. like I can just you're always sort of eating and having this and that, and I'm kind of like, why are you still? What are you doing? Like just mm. eat and be done with it. Mm. It's just different. Like. Yeah. I hate eating. It's like the most annoying kind of, what am I going to eat? Oh, it's all, yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Um, yeah, I had that smoothie for breakfast. And you're like, what a waste, what a waste. of what a waste of a meal having oh, a smoothie. You could have had some 
oat bran and some fruit on top and oh, yum. <laughs> Get a granola. No, just sugar. As a junior who is 200 centimetres, play NBA basketball. Wrong sport. <laughs> that's, that's not the right attitude, is it? Sorry. And 75 kilos. Would it be beneficial to bulk during the winter? Dirty bulk. Yeah. Get it on there. Get your summer shred on. Gain 5 to 10 <laughs> kilos of muscle and some fat. Geez, you're not getting 5 or 10 kilos of muscle no. in bulk. I'm thinking it would make my total watts go up, but my watts per kilo may stay the same or go down a bit. I'm best at longer efforts. I live in Denmark, which is pretty flat. Uh, well, I have gained five kilos since October, but I'm looking in the mirror. I cannot, I can not, I cannot see if I've gained fat, but it might. I think you're overthinking it. Yeah. Just train to get fitter and get stronger. You're a junior. I would say, don't worry too much about your weight as long as it's not dropping off. Like as long as you're healthy, and just gain, train, eat so you can sustain your training and get stronger on the bike. And wherever your weight goes from there, so be it. Like you might be a naturally a skinny rider, you might naturally sort of be I think a bit bigger. We were sort of talking about this the other day. Like if, if you're going to actually try and commit to a weight gain program in the gym, that really does require a heavy gym, predominantly gym, like lifestyle, really. It's, it's not going to be... It's not going to be bikes for, for a long period of time. So, um, you know, at, at your age, just just try and get fitter and stronger on the bike and, and let your body sort of grow into itself. Yeah, exactly. exactly. 200 centimetres, 75 kilos. That's very, that's pretty, not very skinny. It's pretty skinny. Yeah. Because I'm 77 and 189. So, you know, you've got room to, you'll fill out naturally. Yeah, exactly. I wouldn't, don't overthink it. Just Try, just enjoy riding your bike and be, be comfortable if you do put on a couple kilos. It's all good. Um, what do you think is the best cycling cafe in Sydney? Um, Veneziano Coffee Roasters in Surrey Hills. A um, couple of reasons. Rafa uh, RCC members get half price coffee, which is awesome to rock up and get paid two fifty for a brew. But uh, they do good selections. Like they've got the, you can get uh, like a filter coffee, which is free refill. Which is dangerous because you walk out of there and like you, you're on drugs because you've you've had like three or four batch brews and can get a bit sketchy. Um, good location, they do a good. I really like they do a basil and tomato focaccia, so I kind of get that in a coffee. Sits well after a ride. Um, nice outdoor seating, mm. good place to put your bikes. Right, oh, it's probably it's probably my go-to. Any other? Anyone now I'm just trying on? to think of which 7-Elevens we normally stop at. <laughs> uh, yeah. No, I mean, there's the ones down in Walsh Bay are quite good on a, on a sunny, especially in winter. You can get those sort of ones down. There's a few cafes down there along Walsh Bay, which is really nice. Yeah, um, if you're coming back, if you do a north loop, and you're yeah. coming back over the Harbour Bridge and you just yeah. tuck in. Yeah. Yeah, because for us, we've got like people split sort of Balmain. Where are you, Alexandria? Where are you? Waterloo. Waterloo. So, you know, you kind of want a central-ish spot to come back through. Um, where else have we stopped that's any good? Those are the main two. Yeah. If we're coming back south, we'll usually go Veneziano. If we're coming from the north, we'll usually go that Welsh Bay yeah. area. Yeah. Back in the day when we were coming back west, sometimes Fruitologist in Roselle. Yeah. Yeah, Fruitologist, good, like, acai bowl if it's a hot day when you're coming back. Acai. Acai. Go for that. Yeah. All right. Um, You're how really is... asking the wrong people, though. Yeah, we're not wrong channels. big cafe. Uh, a lot of the time when I finish right, I kind of just want to get home and put my feet up and eat like a you know, proper recovery mm. meal or shake. Uh, sitting at a cafe having a coffee, it's like not. No. It's okay sometimes, but yeah, we're not big on. You know, we're not massive on it. Um, how has your FCP increased from starting until now? Geez, two people us. Good Fair question, life. though. Pretty yeah. interesting. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we already answered that one. I tell what, you who'd be interesting, yeah. Aiden, Aiden uh, Buttigieg's FTP, who's started riding with us this year, but he's just on this <laughs> massive yeah. trajectory at the moment. He had a great ride at Nationals. Yeah. Um, kind of like big on the Melbourne crit scene, like good local results. So we picked him, we're kind of like, oh, you know, definitely like really good crit rider, we'll see how he goes. And he's just had like a, a blinder at nationals. He like, wasn't far behind Ben Carmen. Um, 
Yeah. Great ride. Um, one to keep an eye on. What was the thing that made you think, I want to give cycling a try? Keep the good videos and cheers from France. Thanks, Joffrey. Uh, do you want to go first, Chris? Think about this. This is why he won't let me see the questions beforehand. I haven't seen them either. I know, but like I'd actually like to think about this. Um, what is that make cycling give it a go? I'll go. So mine was when I was rowing, there were people that other rowers that were older than me that used cycling as cross training, and I always thought it was pretty cool. I don't know why. Yeah. Why? They weren't pro cyclists. Yeah. They weren't even good. They were. They would. They would have been total hubbards. But I thought it was. No, they would have been strong, but I thought it was just a cool thing. Um, that's a that's really it. It's just a, I don't yeah pretty crap answer. Nothing really in particular. I was just sick of waking up on a Saturday morning with a busted shoulder from being tackled by a two hundred kilo front rower and dressing up in lycra seemed like a better idea. No, I I, I can't think of anything. To be honest, that was the, oh, this is it moment. Yeah. I think the physicality of it as well, like it's real, it's pure fitness that makes you good on the bike. I think that's what, rowing was a lot more about strength. Like you had to, ha- you have to have a lot of strength and power, which naturally I, I'm not that strong. Like I've even in high school, I've oh, never been that strong. Yeah. So I always found it was annoying rowing. Like people, in the, you have to, you know, you gym three times a week, which I was never that good at. Um, oh, that's not a red light. Keep going. Um, I was, yeah, naturally not very good at the strength side, so it was, it was attractive to go to sport like cycling where it was a lot more aerobic, which I was naturally, I, th- I think, a bit better at. Uh, yeah. Uh, would you rather turn up for a group ride without socks or on a TT bike? <laughs> uh, TT rig. Yeah, I, I, I don't actually mind that, like, Rock up on a TT rig and just kind of sit on the back. Mm. Yeah. Rock up with no socks. I've seen just, you do that. Yeah, I, I used to you do went, it. You went through a phase. Yeah, when you're training for time trials, you just sort of rock up on the bunch and sit on the back. Mm. It's all good. Don't start rolling turns on it. That, that's a real no-no. But rocking up with no socks, that's just... Why do Victorians love drive throughs yeah. drive through everything. But there's no one in the drive through That was a drive through small do- donut place. Without socks. Ugh. Yeah, don't get that. That's so gross. Don't get that. Uh, in the last Q&A, Chris mentioned he hadn't taken more than four days off the bike in the last four years, mm. which blew my mind. Currently recovering from COVID, I'm just trying to get started back on the bike after two and a half weeks. Any tips for getting back into training after being sick? Thanks for the videos. Uh, yeah, um, cool. I'll go first on this one. My advice would be, don't look at your power or anything for the first two weeks, I would say. Just ride your bike for two weeks and then start looking at how you're going. Because the first, the first, after a break like that, the first week or two is always going to be crap and then you're kind of looking at power and then you're like, oh, I lost, my, I lost so much fitness. But it, it comes back really quick. So if you just, just get on your bike and ride for a week or two, then see how you're going and check in and then you can get back into training. That would be my one piece of advice. Yeah. Anything, Chris? No, that's exactly it. Two and a half weeks. It's not that long. No. You'll be, you know, you would have lost a bit, but you get a lot back in that first couple of weeks. It's all right. Two and a half weeks is. That's all right. Uh, what sports science slash exercise podcast do you recommend listening to? Um. I'm not that big on them. Uh, pretty much the only cycling podcast I listen to is the Trainer Road one because they tend to like answer questions. They're keeping up to date with what people are interested in. So then I get that, can keep up to date with that. I don't really listen to sports science ones uh, or exercise ones. Chris, do you do? No, I don't do any of those. Uh, yeah. Sorry, don't have a good recommendation. If you both had to sign a pro contract today, which team do you Ooh. sign for? Which best suits your style of writing and character? So I would have... I'll go first. So I would have always, always said Movistar. 
definitely. Especially when they were back on the pre, when they were back on the Pinarellos, uh, and they had, had Campy. I fully loved that ultra Euro spec that they were running. Um, and <laughs> having seen the Netflix series, I only want in more because it looks like an absolute disaster. Uh, and it's all like cojones and just, <laughs> just right. I, I just find the way that is still how a bike team is run just hilarious. And so, yeah, it's got, it's got to be Moby Star for me. Yeah. Well, I'm going to go with a bit of a boring tactical answer. I would, if I was going to be a pro, I would really just want to do a grand tour in particular Tour de France. I wouldn't want to go to anything. So I'd, I'd probably pick a team that would, I'd have a chance of getting picked to do the tour. Like I'm not going to go on Ineos because then, you know, you're not going to get picked. So I'd probably go one of the lower level teams where you got a better, even like one of the pro Conti, like maybe like Wanty, mm. like one of the teams like that where you got a better shot of doing a grand tour. Because yeah. I think like to go and do the Tour de France would be amazing. So for a tactical answer, I'm going to go with that. Uh, what is the most underrated upgrade to bike people look past? Underrated upgrade. Uh, geez, so we're saying that like, we're saying that wheels are, everyone knows yeah, that. Yeah, everyone one. knows that. Right, okay. Um, underrated upgrade. Underrated upgrade. Uh, okay, I got two. I'll go first. The first one is really nice, well wrapped bar tape. Um, I'm really shitty at wrapping bar tape. Mm. And then when I got the bike built, I had the gooey tape from the team, which is like really nice and tacky and looks good. And then the bike shop wrapped it, and it's like totally changes the bike if you have well wrapped, neat bar tape. I think it just makes the bike look nice. And every time I get on, it's like the thing you're staring at. So I think worth, um, if you're not good at wrapping bar tape, just take it to a shop and get some nice quality bar tape, not that cork crap, and um, cheap, good upgrade. Other thing I, I like is, I do like the, the Ceramic Speed OSPW. I'm not sure if that's an underrated upgrade, but a lot of people do dismiss the ceramic stuff and just go, oh, it's just a wank, it's just too expensive. Uh, I, I think I really like the Ceramic good. Speed. I would put it on now if, if yeah, I mean, I could I could afford it, but. Maybe I will. I'm not ruling it out, actually. Yeah. Second half of the year, slap it on. I, I, I did like that. So I'll go with those two of my So I'll, I'll say that like the difference between good tyres and bad tyres is just massive. Like, I don't know if this is particularly underrated, but like if you're running, say, Maxxis Refuse tyres, they are like cement compared to the high roads. Like, it's just, it's a different bike altogether. So spec up on the tyre definitely and obviously set them tubeless but you've heard us rabbit on about that enough only other thing I'll quickly say is if you're running a mechanical group set fresh set of cables fresh set of cables really well done by your, by your local mechanic it might cost a little bit for a good proper cabling but my god it just makes the bike feel totally new again like, Especially really the does. brakes. You know, you feel someone's bikes. They got the, their brakes, and you're like, oh, "How are you riding with that? Like, yeah. get it fixed. Don't live with the slot." Yeah, yeah, definitely right that one. Um, uh, thoughts on SBS and its axing of Tom and Robbie? Uh, not, I don't really have an opinion on that one. I wasn't really. I don't really follow the commentator. It's I didn't schedule. know that. Yeah, uh, I don't know. Do you think Oz oh, Cycling need up. to come up that. with? A new NRS schedule that can incorporate a TV sponsor to broadcast it, or GCN even to, th to grow the talent of our national road series. Uh, How do I say yes in yes. as big a... Uh, yes. It comes down to broadcast rights. Can I just have a quick say on this? Yeah. Yeah. So the only hope that any domestic competition has is broadcasting. That's full stop. So we've said this in the past, we don't care, we don't care, it doesn't exist, but prize money, any of that sort of stuff is irrelevant. The only way to actually get money into the sport in this country is to have someone show it. And it's not until we actually manage to do that that we'll, we'll progress forward. Like Sun Tour, 
two years ago was almost like oh, on the YouTube GCN the YouTube, YouTube. I mean, oh, that yeah. was like the this is how it can be done. Like, and all of a sudden, everyone's watching it, and it just seemed to disappear so quickly. So, um, yes, is the answer to your question. Cool. Uh, as one bogan Aussie would say, if you don't dope, you won't cope. If you don't dope, you won't cope. One bogan Sorry. Aussie. Is that Durian Ryder he's giving a shout out to? And I think to some extent I agree. In your honest opinion, do you think the top dogs of today's pelt, we answered this in the last one, vomit sensing drugs. So microdosing EPO, um, Asami he's talking about here, GW5015116. Uh, I think that's, yeah, cyclist, uh, you know, saw Brandon McNulty recently do 15 minutes at 460 watts, repeats like three weeks. Uh, just on Brandon McNulty, he's been a he's been he's a freak. Like he's been doing those numbers since he was a kid. Like I don't like just because there's guys that pump out, yeah. You know, having those super talents that do massive watts per kilo, I don't think is the best indicator of doping. Your thoughts? I don't really know. Uh, I love to know. I find it super interesting, but you go insane, sort of speculating what people might be doing or. No, no, the, um, yeah. sorry, I'm just yeah. back thinking about the, <laughs> the two questions ago, I'm still going, well, I might come back to a few here. A... Uh, calorie deficit or high carb, low fat for weight loss? Uh, well, calorie, calorie deficit. well, you, Same thing. <laughs> that's, yeah, that, you, <laughs> you can't have, just because you're eating high carb, low fat doesn't mean you can eat a surplus of calories and lose weight. That's not... High, high carb, low fat is, is one method you can use of achieving a calorie deficit. And as I've said previously, the, the, the potential benefit of that is some of the excess calories, you have a bit of a buffer there because you're going to store it as glycogen. So there's more of a, there's a bit of more of a margin for error if you're doing a higher carb thing. Um, that's just how it works. But you still need to be in a calorie deficit over a longer time period to lose weight. So they're not, you can't pick and choose. That's not how it works. Um, so obviously calorie deficit. But that doesn't, you know, measuring calories isn't also perfect because it's like the amount mm. of calories you burn in a day is an estimate. The amount of calories you've burnt on a ride is an estimate. Mm. The amount of calories you've eaten is also an estimate. So you can't be too black and white with it because the, even if you do the whole calories in, calories out thing, it's not exact anyway. So everything has a grain of salt with it. This is kind of where I think a lot of that wearable stuff that we are talking about in the other one, I think, can come in. Because like like you said, it's like all these different estimates of your calorie burn, it's, it's based on sort of generic, like, curves and generic equations. Whereas, you know, if wearable tech gets to that point where it can actually start measuring an individual's calorie burn then you can then calorie counting might actually become a bit more scientific for it would the everyday punter but you're still going to have measuring the calories in the food you eat is also still an estimate well, that's, like if yeah. you have you know you yeah. eat a banana the calories are different if it's ripe or if it's green yeah. like it's totally yeah so you're still even then but you know that it helps. I'm not saying it's useless. I'm just saying it's not like perfect. Uh, currently doing intervals indoors weekdays and longer zone two, zone three rides on the weekends. Uh, my question is: Do you have any tips for finding a suitable road for these intervals? There aren't any hills nearby longer than three minutes, which is quite annoying. Maybe for VO2 work, I could just do more of an unstructured ride where I smash it up all of the climbs. Though, just do efforts on the flats. Like you can you can do VO2 max efforts on a flat road. You, you, your power will be slightly lower than if you're going up a hill, but that's all right. You um, do most of your yeah. stuff on flats. Yeah, yeah. Leo yeah. does most of his on flats. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Go look up um, Leo Yip on Strava. He's been in. I don't know. He's in a bit of a Centennial Park phase at the moment, but he's he's been in there doing efforts, threshold progressions, all heaps of stuff in Centennial Park. I mean, just train on the flat. It's all good. Um, yeah, I think we'll leave that one there. Uh, in general, training on the flat translates well to training on the climb. So actually, if you, if you can only train on the flat, you're actually more of a disadvantage than someone who can only train on climbs. Mm. Like if you live in Andorra, 
and you can only train on climbs, yeah, you'll be climbing well, but when you go into race on the flat, potentially you could argue you'd be at a little bit of a disadvantage because your power on a climb doesn't translate as well to training on a flat. Kind of goes back to what we're saying with you, it's sort of power in a crit, you kind of struggle on the flatter roads. Uh, so yeah. Uh, what are the team goals for 2022? And will we see Jesse Coyle doing Jesse Coyle things? I think we will. I think we will. I think we will. Mid to end of the year. I've already started. I've got a couple of good weeks in. I'll yeah. get back to Maybe some fitness. Right. Um, and that's the thing with... That's my secret, actually. Is I target races that I can actually do well at. It's kind of why you'll see me not do nationals. And, you know, I'm not going to go and train for Tassie. But some of the... You race better in cold weather yeah, as well. Yeah, I am better in the cold. So you'll see me for some of the NRS races in the cold, in some of the intermediate stages, which, yeah, I'm very choosy about the stages I target. And that's kind of why I get, you know, there's probably riders that are stronger than me in the NRS that have never gotten a result because they target the wrong stuff. So yeah, you'll see me, I'll pop my head in. I'll, I think Team I goals is is a bit of an awkward question. Well, it's not awkward, it's, but it's like, we don't sort of go, oh, well, let's let's go all in for nationals or let's go all... We, we have to win Grafton or something this year. Mm. Like, we we just go to every race and try and do as well as we can. Yeah. You know? I mean, we're going to... I mean, the year, in 2020, when we had Jay Vine, you know, it's going to be difficult to match that sort of season. And that's all right. That's, that's how the ebbs and flows of the team. We're not, we're not a team that just goes out and taps the best riders on the sh- in the NRS on the shoulder and tries to select them. We, we, we pick the riders that have fit the team well and that have potential and maybe don't fit into some of those other teams and we, we try and get the best out of them. And it is what it is. Even if we don't get... Yeah, even if we have the worst season in terms of race results, we're still going to yeah. make good videos and make get people excited about it. And uh, Yeah, because like one, one of the things I think that, that sets that is that um, so we have an online application process like no one gets a tap on the shoulder and said told like hey join our team like if you want to join our team like it doesn't matter if you're Richie Porf or Jesse Coyle you just fill out the application form and I think that that actually really changes who applies for the team because it instead of it people being how do I put this like people who think they should be offered a spot on the team. Yeah. It's actually people who want to be on the team. It's so, a bit of a filter. Yeah, if, it's, yeah. A, it's a bit of a filter. And, and it works against us in the sense that you probably don't get the pure elite guys doing it because they think they deserve the, the tap on the shoulder. Yeah. But it does mean that the guys that do want to be a part of it really want to be a part of it. Because we, we go throughout the year and we, we, we'll chat and we'll be like, oh, it'd be good if... I'm not going to name names, but we do go, oh, it'd be cool if that person applied. Like, we would really like to have them on the team. But we never tell that person yeah, that. that because person it's, doesn't apply. Because if they want to be on the team, they would apply. We don't, we're not going to go and, you know, try yeah. and recruit them in that sense. So that's um, quite rare for a, for a top-level yeah. team. Can I also to say team, team goals... So we are a continental team again this year, and that's something that we've done because we really, really hope that Asia is going to open up at some point this year that will let us to go to be a continental team and race continental races. Um, because you can't, like the way the UCI works, right, is you can't just get to like February or March or April and go, oh, look, there's a few Conti races appearing in Asia. Oh, UCI, can we be Conti now? It doesn't work like that. Like, if you've got to be Conti on day dot, I think it's like December 1, get your regos in, otherwise forget about it. So, um, yeah, we're kind of taking a punt. It's a financial punt to do it. Um, but hopefully hopefully the trade-off is our guys can do some of that stuff. Sure. Why are Nero riders so successful at Zwift Academy lately? Team strategy or coincidence? Uh, it's not a coincidence. The, that is one of the best pathways to GoPro for Australian riders and as such we do we, we tell the riders to target it uh, I think a lot of some other teams probably it doesn't do much for the well, actually that's not true it does a lot for the, it's good for the t- exposure of the team other teams don't really recognise that so they don't push it for their riders um, so yeah we, we chat 
when it comes up each year, we chat about it with the team. It's a key goal. We do, you know, it, it's a focus for the team essentially, for the riders, for the, obviously for the riders individually, but we do push it as a team um, to to give our riders the best chance of. Yeah, it's not a coincidence that we do well every year. You know? I think there's there's two things I quickly say. One is that it does come back to the individual guys that are on the team. They're just the strong-willed guys that don't need like to be like sort of spoon-fed stuff. So they they will target it and go after it. And it's really credit to them. The other thing is you only just have to look at, for example, um, Jay when he was going for the Zwift finals. It conflicted completely with the biggest racing of the year for the team but we worked around it with him because you know it's like that's that's how he's going to become pro we gave him year. more days off than yeah. we would have liked big time yeah. you know and yeah. whether other teams would have done that stuff to him and then bigger picture it paid off because gotcha. we sent a rider pro yeah so um, do flexibility exercises work better for aero position do you do it uh, my take on this is, yes, if flexibility is a limiter for you getting in your aero position, then yes, you should work on it. Up until a point though, as, as, as soon as you can, if you can ride in your aero position semi-comfortably, then it's more about spending time in it. So I would say, you know, flexibility is kind of like a, a, bar- a hurdle, a barrier to entry. If your flexibility is good enough, it's good enough, then you work on more of your stability and, and efficiency in the position. It's not like becoming hyper flexible is going to make you exponentially better. It's kind of like hits a threshold and then you're good. I think for most people though, flexibility, oh, I don't know, it's hard to say, but I, I would guess for most people, flexibility isn't an issue. It's more time in the position that's the issue, if I had to guess uh, from my experience. Yeah. Oh, oh good question. Oh. <laughs> Are riders still paying to be on Conti teams? Yeah. We will, yeah. Oh, we yeah. were chatting oh, about this. Oh, this is fantastic. Yeah. Great question. Yeah. So not so not us, not, not our team. Um, but, yeah, definitely. Uh, I am familiar with... I'm not for or against this. I'll say, in fact, it doesn't bother me in either, any way, shape or form. Sorry, there's just an intersection coming up here, so I've got to... Well, got my train of thought. Yeah, I'll keep. So there's a di- there's a di- distinction between paying to be on a Conti teams in terms of like, quote unquote, like sort of bribing the team to select you, and then there's you get selected for the team, but then there's a cost associated with that. I think they're two sort of different things. Uh, in terms of getting selected for a team and then having to pay like a rider contribution or pay for your bike, pay for. Some, anything else like that that's definitely that's common at least yeah that's, that would be quite common at least in a, for some of the Conti teams in Australia uh, you, you would be ex- expected to contribute for lots of your stuff uh, it's not like you just get on a team and they just hand you all this stuff uh, that would be normal were you yeah. going to talk about the other yeah, thing? yes well so okay so there's two, two sides to this right there's the, there's the Australian scene okay and in that space what jesse said the rider contribution all that kind of thing is pretty common just because teams don't have well some teams have multi-million dollar budgets so the bridge lanes and the aras have big budgets and they will fund much of their riders stuff like that which is fantastic i'm not having a go at that that's like awesome that they're able to do that um, then you come down to like the nrs teams and a lot of those will um, you know, you'll pay for your bike. Back when we used to uh, do that with Bianchi, stuff like that. You paid for your bike, you owned your bike. There was a bit of a rider contribution, which would go towards your kit and that kind of stuff. But, you know, where that kind of gets murky is if you start having to also pay for your entry fees for races and pay for your accommodations, you're a bit like, well, hang on, I just bought the bike, bought the kit, bought my team accommodation and bought my race entry. Hang on, and, a loss here. I, and oh, hang on! You want me to pay for team coaching? Uh, what? No, that's a mark. I think right there. Just yeah. look out what's going on in that place. Um, then, then there is the uh, European continental. How Australian guys are getting onto some continental teams in Europe, and yes, they are paying thousands of euro to get onto some of those teams. Now. 
I don't particularly have an issue with that. I've heard numbers up to around like 30,000 bucks to get onto a European Conti development team. And look, at the end of the day, it gets you over there, gets you onto a team, uh, you have the money, fair enough. Um, and potentially, really, it's only like someone going to a, a soccer camp or a skiing camp or something like that for, for a year. So it definitely still happens. I think where it really gets murky is if you are, you know, if, if it's Jesse Coyle versus Chris Miller to get that spot and I turn around and go, well, I'll give you 30 grand to pay my way onto the team. Well, you know, I don't know. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, it still happens. Like, I yeah. think it will always happen. I, I, the, there's an Italian Conti team at the moment that essentially funds its race budget by getting guys to pay to get on the team. Mm-hmm. But, you know, they give them accommodation, they give them race starts, they give them a bike worse ways to spend you know I did a gap year ski instructing I was probably spend as much as much money uh, what's your favourite cycling film mm. I haven't watched many cycling films Slaying um, the Badger okay. it's more of a cycling doco but yeah Slaying the Badger yeah that green that green edge one whatever that one was called that was, was pretty good I hated that okay, that's Slaying it, Adjo. Uh, do you guys do cross training aside from the gym? If so, why? I don't do any. Chris, you don't really do any. No. Uh, every like every six months, I'll do like a week of running, <laughs> and then realize it's a terrible idea and stop. That's about it. Uh, expansion on first question from last time. Best cycling, best city in Australia. Of, Cycling-wise, for road, mountain bike, gravel. Uh, oh my god, these questions. Uh, okay. Can we answer this in the last one? Yeah, Queen's I was way. a bit, I was a bit harsh on on Adelaide as well. So I do want to throw Adelaide into the mix. Um, I, I, okay. I, the other one that we didn't say is Canberra. Mm. I actually think Canberra would be a cracking pure bike city really would be actually yeah actually if you're looking at mountain bike gravel and road yeah. Canberra's probably Canberra would be bloody good so Nathan Haas did a tweet the other day saying he, he did the, he, he did the best gravel ride he's ever done in Canberra and he had no idea that the roads ex- we were talking about oh I was just quickly going to say yeah Nathan Haas was saying oh yeah he's done some amazing gravel rides in Canberra he had no yep. idea existed so yeah I think Canberra um, if you're doing all those different disciplines. Favourite ice cream? Uh, I'm not a big ice cream fan. Um, so if I had to pick one, I'd probably say you know, Ben and Jerry's. But I don't really like ice cream. So I got two. Uh, so if, if I'm getting gelato, I definitely want a scoop of lemon and a scoop of chocolate. And if it's just boring old everyday run of the mill ice cream can't beat a magnum sorry can't beat it mm-hmm. uh, how much zone 2 training in the- <laughs> good to face. have you back he's no that was a joke well done triggered uh, <laughs> uh, what can you say about the UCI world championships what's the parkour like which type of rider does it suit best I've seen like, they're going to go up Mount Kira it looks like a pretty hilly course, but I haven't looked at it in full, so I don't. I can't really say, uh, you know, okay. who it exactly suits. What doesn't suit Caleb Ewan is who it doesn't suit. Yeah. Like, you know, I, I just which just blew my mind because I just thought like clearly this was c- cycling Australia or their opportunity to just go right. Let's go all in for Caleb. Let's line it up. Yeah. Let's just do laps of Port Kembla Steelworks and finish with a sprint down Wollongong. Yep. But no, I, he's not going to win. Um, you know, I think it's it's potentially looking at it's a Sunny Colbrelli mm. 
um, those mm. sort of, as the Lantern Rouge would call them, the sprinty, climby boys. I think it's that type of thing for me. A uh, whole generation of those guys coming through. Um, yeah. Uh, do you guys ride mountain bikes? If so, what's the best category of mountain bike in your opinion? I don't ride mountain bikes. Never really done mountain biking, <laughs> so I don't have a comment. Chris? I've ridden my mountain bike seven times and twice on trails. Uh, so potentially not the right people to talk no. to, um, but mine's a hard tail uh, mountain bike and cross country. I th I'm gonna ride more of it this year and I, I wanna ride the centenary. My, one of my goals of racing is to ride the centenary trail around Canberra on my mountain bike. Uh, is gravel racing going to take off in Australia like it has in the US? Oh, don't know. Problem with the, Austra yeah. Australia's, problem is Australia is very big, so people traveling to racing is not as big as I think, as it is, like in the US you can have, you know, the cities have millions and millions of people each, so you can kind of get a good turnout for a gravel race, or as, here, if you have a gravel race in New South Wales, to make it successful, you're going to need gravel riders from Victoria and from Queensland. It's a long way to travel, so I don't know. I, uh, you know, I hope so. Maybe. Yeah, I hope so. Uh, but no, not not to the level it's gone in the states. But by the looks of what's going on in the states, it's, it's taken over road racing, really. Yeah. Hasn't it? It looks, yeah, you know? the coverage is big. Yeah. I mean, look, the, the, the big pushing thing for it here is going to be, and, um, you know, you've seen a little bit of us with us with the drops and hood stuff, is like for event organisers to put bike races on on the road in Australia is just a punish. Like it's, it's complete, the numbers are ridiculous. Like two and a half, like quarter of a million dollars to put like traffic plans together. Whereas if you're doing a gravel race, you don't have those problems. So... Yeah, I think there's there's future in it, but yeah. yeah. Uh, geez, you guys look ropey. Is is an end of Mammoth Drive look or night on the Terps? Ropey. Uh, the support. Yeah. Um, Should see we'll us blame now. the lighting in the car. Uh, would you ride disc brakes if you didn't race at a high level? Uh, no, I prefer. This is the thing, I prefer rim brakes mainly because they're easier to maintain. You don't have to constantly go to the bike shop. So I would always choose rim brakes just because it's easier to live with. So no, I wouldn't choose disc brakes. Neither would Chris. What's the grossest thing you've ever seen someone do in a race? <laughs> so I don't have one, but I've heard, I'll let Chris tell because I have heard stories. Uh, yeah, on the start line, New Zealand Cycle Classic, uh, an Evo, an Evo Pro rider, I don't know if they still exist, maybe they do, maybe they don't, um, I was on the front row, standing there, and over our bikes, and this guy next to me, Kiwi, sorry Kiwis, goes, oh yeah, that's a relief. And then sort of opens his leg up a bit, and they can see this like liquid running down his leg. <laughs> Pissed his pants on the start line, ready to roll. Yeah. Kind of have a look at the rest of him. Uh, no bar tape on his bike. It's like, right, pretty serious vibe off this dude. That's probably oh. the best. You'd, I you'd saw. then start off, and there'd be drips flying back in the yeah. bunch. That is foul. That's fucking yes, silly. Uh, Problem was he was really strong as well, so he was like, well, so I didn't get to see much of him. Yeah. Uh, do you like mountain bike or just road? Uh, we answered that. Just road. I'm not, I'm, I would love to do mountain biking, but yeah. we don't really have access. Living in the middle of Sydney, there's not really any good mountain biking close by. Like we did some rides in Ballarat, and you're riding past what looked like pretty cool mountain bike trails, and both of us were there. Like, yeah, if I lived in Ballarat, I'd totally run all these bikes, but. For me to go ride a mountain bike, I've got to put it in the car, drive at least an hour, and then do it. I just can't be bothered. Uh, Favourite World Tour race to watch? Paris-Roubaix. Paris-Roubaix. Cam Ivory crit win breakdown. Oh, you whacked him with 
what was it, three laps to go and did a massive power and can corner well because he's a mountain biker and blitzed everyone. Win for the good guys, top bloke. That's usually like a really cringe thing to say, but he really, I think, well, no, generally it usually is like one of the good guys. It's like, well, who are you to deem the good guys? No, but uh, but I was going to say, universally, like he's very well liked. Yeah. So yeah. I just have a thing with when people say, oh, the good guys, and it's like, it's usually some dickhead saying it, and you're like, who are you to deem the good guys? Um, can you speak about getting into racing in Sydney? At lower levels, I feel that I'm reasonably fit, but just don't know how to start racing. Uh, it's easy. First, go to Oz Cycling. Google Oz Cycling four-week free membership. You can and sign up. That gives you your racing license. Then go to Buncher. Dot com and look up where the racing is on around you and enter. Enter D grade if they have it. Some races actually have E grade. But yeah, if I mean, if you, you say you're four watts per kilo plus, that doesn't matter. So you've got to start in D grade or C grade and just and enter. And then you rock up at wherever the race is 20 minutes before your start time and sign, and sign on, get your number and start racing. Um, yeah, but take advantage of that four week free trial membership because if you want to sign up to be a racing member at Oz Cycling for a year it's like over 300 bucks so use the free trial first and and yeah and when you do that you have, you'll have to pick a club to, to join to sign up because every Oz Cycling member is affiliated with the club so you just pick whatever your nearest club is to sign up um, just do it just do it sign up find the races that are on and just go and do it and um, like yeah. there's, you don't need to know anything like Every person in your race, like, has potentially no idea as well. It's there's no sort of secret handshakes. Just, mm. just have a crack, see what happens. And and like when you go to the race, let the people there know it's your first race, and just ask questions. Just but people that people that are running the race are all volunteers from the local club. So just say, hey, it's my first race. Can you give me some tips or let me know where to go? Like people will really be happy to help you out. Just don't don't be shy about it. Uh, Luke Plapp nets win. Strava reviewer breakdown. Uh, Luke Plapp hasn't uploaded anything on Strava for a while. I've already looked. Don't worry. Um, but we had a chat at the start of this about well, you can you can guess what his season, what his preparation would have been like, looking back on the racing he's done the past few months. So we kind of chatted about that. Can you guys recommend a book or two on endurance training slash cycling training? Um, I hate reading books, so no, I I never read books. Uh, so I don't have a book recommendation. Not a serious, book on, who's going to read a mean. book on cycling? I mean, problem if you're trying to read a book on endurance training, you're just you're down rabbit holes, really. I don't know, in my opinion. time was better spent yeah. just writing your bike. Just yeah, save the time and just hire, if you don't know what you're doing, just hire a coach. Um, save yourself. That's it. There you go. <laughs> uh, favorite chocolate, and where do you both? And where do both of you originate come from? Favourite chocolate. So, uh, favourite uh, chocolate, uh, consumer boast, would be the Lint 85%. Uh, but, um, Belle Fleur chocolates in Roselle, if uh, it's ever Christmas or Easter coming up, Belle Fleur chocolates, Roselle, send them to me. That's what I want. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll do the chocolate bit as well. Chocolate, a lot of shout out for the Boost Bars in the previous video, which was the secret message. So I'm going to second that Boost Bar from a, from a generic point of view. Something more upper class, I do like Hague's, the freckles from Hague's, um, really nice. Or like the chocolate coated um, Sultanas from Hague's are yeah. really good. Second part of that question for you, Chris, was where do you originate slash come from? Uh, in the West, born and raised? Grew up in Balmain. Yeah. Balmain, boy. That's it. And I'm similar, uh, actually, you know, Bondi, actually, as a, wow. as a, as a kid. Wow, jeez, yeah. dropped that in. Bondi, then Inner West, so Stanmore area. Uh, and Lilyfield as well. Uh, so all, always from Sydney. How does the style of racing differ between Australia and Europe or other places? And is the difference a challenge when a, when a cyclist goes to, say, Belgium to race? What's this? Uh, I think, I mean, most people know this, the style of racing. The courses are different. The weather's different. The depth of the field is different over in Europe. You're just going to have bigger fields, more strong riders. Um, yeah. Uh, 
style. I mean, flat, uh, if you're in Belgium, as Belgium, Netherlands, you're going to have a lot flatter races, a lot more wind. Probably the wind, actually, is probably the biggest one. Um, you're really getting good at riding in crosswinds and stuff. If you're racing in Australia domestically, you don't really need to be good at racing in the wind unless you're doing Tour of the Great South Coast. Sorry, wind, I missed this question. I just factor. had to make that left turn. Oh, just difference in racing between Australia and Europe. Uh, yeah, kind of answers it. Yeah. Hey, boys, drive safe. Thanks, Andrew. Okay. Chocolate one, any, the dark chocolate um, cherry ripes as well. This whole new range of like dark chocolate stuff. I'm loving that dark chocolate tin. Sorry, we're we still talking about chocolate. We should still definitely still be talking about chocolate. I like chocolate. Uh, okay, a whole bunch here. Okay, let's do let's do quick fire. Quick, there's like seven questions here. Okay. Tell us about Luke Platt. From memory, did he ride to Nero at one stage? Yes. Yep. Luke was on Nero. Yep. Uh, you back uh, in your yeah, ilk. real real quick story. Um, yeah, he's in the vlog. Actually, I'll, we'll, I'll give you the link. You can drop it at some point in there. Uh, he uh, came on board in 2017. Yeah, look, it's a, it's a story where he had, hadn't got into the... The track program that was always his goal was getting into the track program stuff at that stage and um, came to us really late in one of the years and um, was, was keen to do a lot of time trialing stuff so he only did um, I only raced Tour of Mansfield VRS race with him which was sort of early one year and he was already starting to win a lot of that like he was under 19s and he was winning elite time trials at that point so we, he did that race and came to, came to us like a month later and CA had gone back to him and said, look, we're interested in putting you back in the track program at that stage. So we really only had him for, for six months, but it was that first, he was, we we're actually his first team. And he, he won the junior national time trial. Junior, new, junior national time trial. Um, and that's, that's kind of where we let him go, basically, and let him go into the... Not that we had a choice. No, <laughs> we could have, actually, because he had a contract. But, you know, you're not going to turn around a young bloke and say, no, you can't ride for Australia. And the plan then was that he would go into the track program with, with Australia and hopefully compete in the World Championships later that year. And he did, and he got beaten by Remco. Uh, and I think was in the track program following that. And that... That the track program aligns itself with Inform, which is one of the teams in Australia, and and um, cycling, Oz Cycling actually pay for those riders to be on Inform, so it's a nice little setup that they have. So yeah, that was kind of his progression from there. But like I said in the beginning of the Q and A today, like when he first, I remember doing that VRS race with him, and he was like meticulous to the absolute. PSI of his time trial bike for that VRS race. And that was, you know, a 19-year-old kid. It was great seeing the team on the Foxtel coverage. What was it like for you both seeing the crew at the front of the peloton? Actually, this is quite funny. So the, at Nationals, you're not allowed race radio. So we're in the car, but we can't do anything because you're not allowed to... We, we can't speak to the riders. So for that one lap there that you probably saw, the guys were riding on the front. Uh, we didn't really agree. We're not really sure why. They kind of, they kind of just started riding the front. Uh, so watch watch our upcoming we race were, vlog, yeah. and you'll get the full uncut version of yeah. this. Chris is going to do a video from the day. So yeah, we were a bit like, "What the fuck are you guys doing riding the front? Let let bike exchange ride." Uh, so yeah, um, did the race play out the way you thought? Uh, Nationals is very unpredictable, especially this year with less of their pro teams having big depth in their squads uh, it was a little more uncontrolled so we were kind of we were expecting a crazy race which is what we had um, did the oh, I'm new to the economics of cycling could you do the broad outline of professional cycling teams cash in oh, might have to that would be here for hours going through the budgets of different levels of teams uh, uh, if people are interested in that I'd definitely like to do that at some stage not yeah. this it's, that's a great question so GoPro turning off. Uh, what's more dangerous, a professional cyclist or an F1 driver? Ooh. Oh, a professional cyclist. F1 Definitely. driver. What? Well, not now. Yeah, okay. 
In terms of like death, well, how many? No, I think professional cyclists crash all the time, broken bones, and you know, any pro cyclist going into a season of racing is probably expecting they're going to break a bone. Mm. You would think. Yeah. yeah what's okay. F1 drivers do? Yeah. Uh, I, I'd probably argue like as a like a the second and third tier sort of drivers are pretty dangerous but the yeah no pro cyclists yeah. you're right Jesse what was it like for you having the great Durian Rider review a video uh yeah he's the only person that's ever done a reaction to any of my videos that was pretty cool uh, someone actually brought this up in the other videos he and like oh you know you got heaps of subscribers from his channel look at his channel he doesn't get that many views I, I get more views on most of my videos than he does even though he's got a lot of subscribers so I, I don't this idea that he's funneling heaps of subscribers to me, I, I think, is not true. Um, even after I did that video on his stuff, I didn't get a, a big bump in subscribers. So, yeah, it was cool having someone review my video and be positive about it. But, um, yeah. Oh, and finally, Mila, you're so Sydney-centric. I love it. I'm not familiar with the city. Tell us, tell us about the city and why you love it. Uh, wow. Why am I so, am I so Sydney-centric? I'm worldly. What are you talking about? Why do you... Yeah, Sydney. Yeah. Um, because I lived in Dublin for a long time and realised... <laughs> the weather's good. The weather's <laughs> much better here. Uh, ch -ch -ch. No, look, I think some of the stuff in the videos and obviously the, the way, the look of the feel of the team and everything is, is kind of based around the Sydney stuff. And that's because, like, I kind of think it's important that there is like a foundation to the whole thing and the location is a foundation. Um, I don't love Sydney. I think there's, there's, it's pretty broken in terms of right driving and that kind of stuff. Uh, no, I look. Uh, no, we can, I don't, yeah. Chris, yeah. to explain. Can Chris explain his foray into making kit genuinely interested plus others can learn? Um, that probably needs to be a whole video. Yeah. I mean, like, I don't want to be rude. I'm going to skip that one. Maybe hound Chris in the comments if you want him to do a video on... Oh, that would be an interesting video. How you got into it, why you stopped. Like, I feel like that needs a good 10 minutes. Which, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um... Do you do generic plans for beginners, not chasing to nitty gritty coaching? Do you just need to be pointed in the right direction? Give some tips if you don't like, or if you don't, any advice or tips? Do you do generic plans? No, I don't do generic plans. There's enough of them everywhere. Um, just need to be pointed in the right. So this person says not, cha not to chasing nitty gritty coaching detail. I just need to be pointed in the right direction and given some tips. Well, if you want to be pointed in the right direction and given tips, you're going to need to pay for it. That's what a coach does. Uh, if you want, specific advice yeah you, you're not going to get that for free if you don't have any advice or t something get dropped in the first crit bad habit and don't want that to happen again uh, I think yeah, it's not a really a specific question here so I don't want to be rude but I'll skip that one can I just have a quick we, we've answered heaps of questions here that'll push up, yeah. quick whinge about people that drive just below the speed limit then it gets to the overtaking lane and they speed up to like 10 k's an hour above the speed limit so you can't get past them and then you get back to the single lane and they drop back down to under the speed limit rant over <laughs> how many six hour rides during the base season is too many oh jeez we're back we're back on a base training and how long should you be riding zone 2 before lowering volume and upping intensity how many six hour rides during the base season is too many 11 <laughs> I'm going to go with 11 <laughs> How long should you be riding zone two before lowering volume and upping intensity? 13 weeks. <laughs> what are your favorite cycling podcasts? Uh, trainer, uh, I like the trainer road ones. Uh, you just like the trainer road ones because you're like picking them apart. No, I agree. I, I like a lot of the stuff they say. Okay. I, okay. I didn't actually, no, to be honest, I a few years ago I didn't, mm. but recently they, they have changed some of their... I, I think they do a good job. Okay. Yeah. Um, Lantern Rouge. So, really like um, the stage reviews that they do on um, stage racing. I've been really enjoying the race previews. Uh, sorry, the, the team previews. 
Um, that's the only pro one that I listened to. I tried the cycling podcast a little bit. I tried uh, cycling news. I don't mind Velo News, the um, the Nerd Alert one. I don't mind that when they do a subject, quite techy subject. Um, sorry, that's the cycling tips one. And um, look, I'll try every now and again, Mitch, but I can't do it. Peloton. I can't do it. Yeah. Well, yeah. You know, you can't. Like, you can't it. like everything. No, exactly. Yeah. 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 I like um, the move Lance Armstrong's podcast when it's on during the Tour de France. I'm a big fan of that too. I rate that. How much do breaks between intervals affect the adaptation my body does? Is it better to do longer breaks to get more quality, or just lower the watts or time spent in the zone? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, it depends. Well, it depends on the session. Um, I don't. I don't want to be rude. It's not really a good question because it just oh. it depends on what the goal of the session is. Do breaks between intervals affect the adaptation? Well, yes. But whether that's, I'm not, you can't say whether that's good or not because it depends what adaptation you're going for. Is it better to do longer breaks to get more quality? Right, so mm. longer breaks, higher power, mm. or lower the power and have less breaks. Well, de- yeah, again, it depends what, you're, what, you, what ad- adaptation you're going for. What, you know. If you're trying to improve your capacity in a, in an energy in in a in a zone like if you're trying to improve your threshold power you could argue that you'd be better to do longer breaks and do higher power mm. like do 10 minute efforts slightly above threshold with longer breaks you know probably, if you're trying to build your threshold um, but that doesn't mean lowering the power and doing shorter breaks also has a also has a place um, yeah as well so yeah they both have merit how to get into crit racing uh, we answered that one if you do so how do you get about adjusting your tyre pressure based on conditions oh great on question conditions. okay I'm going to go I'm going to answer really short and brief and just say rough road slightly lower pressure wet slightly lower pressure I don't have any numbers to put to that maybe you maybe you're playing maybe five to ten psi below your, what you'd normally run in wet or really rough conditions that's about all I've got to say on that yeah I, I kind of think that um, so running tubeless now what I've what I've really discovered is that small changes in psi make massive differences so you know I, I'll run normally around sort of 60 the difference between 60 and like 55 or 56 is quite noticeable. Um, I, I think the next bit of tech that hopefully we'll see are those um, the tyre pressure measurers. That I think Quark do one or Zip do one. Yeah. But it's like $300 yeah. or something. Like the only manufacturer of them. So hopefully we see a few more of those and we can get a bit more exact with that because I think there's, there's actually good gains to be made in that. Um, I'll always do the before a race, probably put you know sixty five in, you know, just a little bit more than I train with because, yeah, feels faster. Feels <laughs> faster, but apart from that, I'm going to try and get around this guy. Just give me a moment. I bet he speeds up. You watch. Uh, when doing strength training, is doing three instead of two strength sessions per week beneficial, or does it just hurt your harder stresses on the bike more? Uh, for cyclists, two per week is enough. You could argue like pure off-season or very early pre-season, you could go to three a week if you, if you feel like it, but for most people, two is enough. Should I do more zone two training? God, I hope... Is, this, uh, is someone trolling us? Uh, aero bike versus climbing bike. Climbing bike with aero wheels. Yeah. Yeah. You were, you were commenting a lot yeah. of the Victorians do that, the so, Masters boys. Yeah, so I, I noticed this in the, in the Masters race the other day, right? So it was a lot of, between 2016, 2019 space, rim brake bikes. So let's call them uh, the Focus, the Alco Maxes, the S-Works, what were they, the Super, Tarmax? Super 6, yeah, yeah the Tarmax. Tarmax, the Super 6 Evos. 
what else that that sort of like spectrum of bike with a high-end group and then at least 50 mils normally 60 mils of wheel and guarantee like that was the go-to go-to bike and I think for you know a real good mix of of hill you know the average speed of these bike race was was still like was like 35 k's an hour more Yep. With like over a thousand meters of climbing, wasn't it? It was like fifteen hundred meters of climbing. Yeah. That was like the fastest setup. Yeah, so you got you got a bike that's pretty much on the weight on the six point eight, but you've yep. basically got super deep wheels that just yep. hum along. Hum along. And it's a win. I'm all I, I, I rate yeah, it. I rate that. It's kinda of like what we run with the bells with the yep. with the fifty fives. Yeah. Uh, what is the most overrated upgrade people do? Oh, so we had underrated mm. underrated upgrade. What is the most overrated upgrade people do to their bike? training and diet i'm gonna i don't want to be rude let's go let's go let's keep this to bike what's the most overrated bike upgrade disc brakes uh, overrated. Uh, that's a, it is a tough one isn't it oh okay i got one um, so overrated, I would say like really expensive brand name wheels, like people that, you know, they're good, like, you know, Envy's with Chris King hubs. Don't get me wrong, they're very nice, but do they perform much better? They cost like, you know, between four and five grand. Are they that much better than a, you know, a set of Metron, Vision Metrons or a set of fast sports that are gonna cost, you know, two grand? So that's my opinion on it anyway, but I'm not I'm not a big gearhead, so maybe I'm wrong. I really want to pull something good out of here, but I'm struggling. Um, maybe like pedals or something, but I suppose that's not really rated, is it? Yeah. Um okay. Move on, maybe. Why That's school here, isn't it? Why is well? There's no editing going on here, so we got to keep the chat yeah, going. Enough. The BBC sitting here going, "Come on, lads." Uh, why is no? Why is no one racing BCD grade? They're all just keeping it together for a sprint. Ah. Oh. So in the lower grade, how come in the lower grades it's less tactical and people don't seem to be racing as much? Whereas A grade, you get lots of breakaways and things like that. Um, it's because I would say the key driver is that in B, C and D grades, you've got people that are quite happy just to get a good session in, get a good hard workout, you know, weld a few moves, ends in a bunch sprint, you know, I rolled in, I rolled in, finished in the bunch, pats on the back, good race everyone, and go home and everyone can be happy. I think that's the main reason. People get a good session in, everyone's happy, um, which I don't necessarily have a problem with. Um, I would, you know, it's more fun when there's more tactics going on, but I'd say that's the main driver is that more people, whereas in A grade, people aren't happy just to get a good session in and ha- end it in a sprint. People want them. It's more competitive. I think there's, a, there's yeah, there's, and there's also, uh, yeah. The, the thing with riding a breakaway as well, like riding a really good effective breakaway, that, that actual skill isn't as um, prevalent in B and C grade. So by that I mean um, guys rolling really fast, efficient turns in a, in a group of like three and four, whereas in, in lower grades guys will try and like rip the, rip the legs off someone in a breakaway and then blow up their breakaway mate and then it's all already exploded and you've come back. Um, but I think the main reason is, is kind of what you said like yeah even then I mean there's you know there's, there's three or four guys on the front of the bunch that'll just pull turns and yeah. just bring everything back just because just yeah. just that's fair you know, that's, that's fine fair yeah, that is what it is uh, when I watch high level races they often they are often able to throw down big sprints at the end of the race is the ability to hit sprint when heart rate is nearly max trainable I hit I can hit 1,300 watts for five seconds all day when my heart rate is under control. But when I'm at 95% of max heart rate, I'm lucky to be able to hit 800 watts for five seconds. Uh, 
yes, having going into a sprint having already done a max effort or near maximal effort is going to detract from your sprint. Um, I would say 1300, going from 1300 watts down to 800 watts is a big drop off. Like, I wouldn't, you know, if, if you're able to do 1300 watts for five seconds fresh, you should still be able to hit a thousand watts when you're in the box, just off the top of my head. So, I'd say there's something going on with that. That's a big drop off. Isn't that it? is, you know, like yeah. think about if you're finishing a, if you're if you're finishing a 20 minute FTP test, mm. and someone says go on quick sprint, you should still be able to mm. get within 300 watts of your max power. So I, uh, I don't actually think this is true. Uh, fake news. I think this is fake news. Wow. I reckon if I went out with you, got your heart rate up there, and, and shouted at you and told you to sprint, you'd, you'd crack a thousand watts. So I think this is more this. Yeah, it's in your head, I'm going to say. Uh, bi uh, bi bike cleaning, another bike cleaning one. Bike cleaning, if it's dry and under normal riding conditions, say three rides per week at 40k per ride, how many times do you clean or what's your typical cleaning routine? Um, as bike parts are expensive to replace, uh, as I said, I do the wax space lube, dry rag the chain, no degreasing required, and then it's a, clean, a frame and wheel clean. I'm going to do a video on that. So the only thing I'd be careful of is, uh, so I actually find I clean my bike a lot more in summer, and that's because of sweat. So uh, sweat is salt, and salt drops down into my bottom bracket, or even like around the hoods and the levers and that kind of stuff. So I will tend to, if I've had a week of sweaty rides, like those three or four rides, and it's been like a salt, salt fest, I will do a, a clean once a week just purely for that reason um, yeah and it's it's just it's a similar in enough sort of procedure to what he does but I will use a hose and and get a good clean in it yeah one other little tidbit I like here is never leave your bike with your chain wet uh, I don't know if you've ever oh, left yeah. your bike when it's wet and you go back the next morning and the chain's got rust on it that kills the light you've literally just like yeah. half the chain is just been oxidized so never leave your bike wet dry it and then ideally dry it and then re-lube if even if you can't dry it, if you're in a super rush just re-lube the chain that having the lube on the chain stops it oxidizing so just really really important uh, yeah. pro tip i'm sorry but air compressor it is a game changer it is an absolute game changer and it you can double it as a way to put your tubeless wheels on. Yeah, like, so the air can, you can what? You can blow the air out of all yeah, the bits. Yeah, so you blow the air out. Um, it's like, so therefore you don't get any of that water left on the, and it, do, it honestly doesn't take that long. It really, it's faster a lot of the time. It's just noisy. So yeah, your, your uh, apartment neighbors aren't probably gonna do it. But you make sure you get a little adapter that then allows you to use it for your tubeless wheels as well. When, when finishing a training session late in the day, around an hour before sleeping, when, which recovery drink is better for performance and weight loss? Protein and carbs or protein only? I generally use SAS Rego after training, anytime before main evening meal, but rather the, but, but later than this, I would use SAS Advanced Isolate, which is protein only. I feel like I don't eat extra carbs when I'm going to be sleep soon after. Uh, first thing I'd say is what are you doing the next day? If you're planning on riding the next day, you need to take carbs in even if it's an evening session, protein doesn't refuel your muscles. Protein assists in repairing muscles. So if you're planning on riding the next day, doesn't matter how, if you, even if you're doing your ride at nine o'clock at night, you need carbs in and it's gonna refuel you. That's the fueling process. Are you eating dinner before or are you still having a meal after this recovery food as well? Yes, yeah, so this person's saying, I generally use SAS after training anytime before main evening meal okay but later than this i would use sas advanced isolate i don't think it, i don't think it matters even if you ha if you're having a meal after yeah like why would you have a protein shake after your ride then have a meal like if you're gonna have a meal just skip yeah. skip your recovery shake and just have dinner yeah, yeah. i think uh, people per yeah. personally like can i say something like the 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 recovery window thing i just to be a little bit more chilled with it especially if you've got a meal planned like a nice good nutritious meal like within you know an hour or two of your your session finishing, don't feel like within sort of four seconds of finishing the last interval, you have to have this recovery shake. It's like 
especially if you've actually got some fuel on board during the actual efforts. Like, as long as you're getting that nice, nutritious meal in afterwards. Is that a fair comment? Definitely, yeah. yeah. You don't need to you can have a meal. Right. But, but the, the last part of this question I just want to hit on again, because it says, I feel like I don't need the extra carbs when I'm going to be going to sleep soon after. You can't... You got to think a bit further. Don't stop thinking three or four hours in advance. Start thinking days in advance. Like if you're training the next day, the carbs you're having after a session aren't for the next three or four hours. It's, they're going to be absorbed. They're going to be stored in your muscles as muscle glycogen, and you're going to start the next session better off. Um, from yeah, obviously there's a whole thing that could go in if you're doing this carb periodization stuff, which I, for most people I don't recommend doing. That's when you might restrict carbs after a training session to do a a carb de- a, a, a ride with depleted muscle glycogen the next morning that's where that starts to come into play but I don't recommend doing that anyway but yeah carbs are for one two days in advance and some, yeah. uh, new to road cycling but want to get into crit racing what is a good base level of fitness to aim for before signing up for my first race there are 60 year old grandmas that race what's your excuse pin a number on great answer Great answer, Jesse Coyle. Well how said. often you? How often do you do mobility training exercises? Uh, I don't do them ever. If I'm feeling a bit tight and sore, I, I like the massage gun. Chris, do you do mobility? Stuff? Yeah, I'll, I'll do some stretching, um, especially like if you're you know sitting down, editing for a few hours after a ride or that kind of thing. Definitely try and keep moving. Um, Hip flexor stuff, I tend to do a good bit of. I get pretty tight in there. Um, I noticed you used the massage gun, um, and I love that. I forgot mine, so I'm going to be borrowing yours a bit, a bit on this. I've been relying on that a good bit during during COVID, actually. Um, yeah, hit the ITBs with that, hit the glutes with it. Um, good. Cool. Um, yeah, for our friend, this is some. I think this is some basketball thing. For our friend Chris, happy or not to see Kyrie back playing, even if he doesn't play any home. He's like someone in tennis who also refuses take the V word. Well, joke is gone. He's been kicked out of the country. So thanks for coming, Novak. Only disappointment there is I would have loved to see what the crowd's reaction there was. And I know this isn't a Kyrie channel. I'm not allowed to talk about it. But I want to quickly so throw one thing in You've got in this. 15 seconds got 15 because seconds. I could not care less. Right, cool. So what I really want to happen is Brooklyn to play Toronto in the playoffs, which means Kyrie can't play home games, can't play away games. Boom. There's a nugget for you. There's I have no idea what you just said. <laughs> have you guys listened to Lance Armstrong's podcast, The Move? He gives insight into major races. I like the honesty. Because uh, that's what Lance has yeah. always been about. <laughs> He wants most races to finish up here, blah, blah, blah. I think Lance and George, blah, 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 blah. Yep, I like the Move podcast. Uh, in saying that, Lance is a bit... He's honest, but he's also kind of like... You know, his chat about, like, you know, where Chris Froome uses a big cassette. You know, he's, he's sort of... Lance is honest, but he's also out of touch and old school. So, you know, like, you know, when he goes on about, oh, you know, disc brakes are, you know disc brakes have changed the peloton because they can descend so much faster. It's like, shut up, Lance. No, they haven't. Like, you know, he's very... And Lance... Are, and the other thing with Lance is he's, he's extremely corporate. He runs an, a venture capital firm who invests in everything. He's, everything he says is basically marketing. So I think as entertaining as it is, it's all kind of grain of salt stuff because, you know, he's probably invested in Ventum bikes or he's got some... Yeah, I just... It's interesting in that way. It's the only thing I'd probably say. Um, so yeah, keep that in mind when he says stuff. Were you a Lance fanboy? Like he was before you? my era. Oh. I never really saw him race, but I'm a big fan. I, 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 yeah. I find him entertaining. I was yeah. on the the comeback when he made the comeback. <sighs> Massive fanboy. <laughs> oh, I got the kit and everything. I rode with him in Dublin. There you go. <laughs> My target races are around an hour in duration, circuit races and cyclocross. Are there performance gains to be had using training sessions significantly longer or shorter than an hour? Uh, definitely, definitely. Um, so you're obviously gonna do your, your race simulation type work around an hour long, but yeah, you're also 
should do shorter stuff, um, you know, interval sessions and things like that that are going to be under an hour. You, you could have a, a ride that's an hour long, but you might do 25 to 35 minutes of actual, you know, interval work. So yeah, definitely shorter and definitely longer as well. Um, to add, you know, to overload your weeks and develop, to develop your aerobic systems, you're going to do longer rides and accumulate volume during the week, even though you might think, well, why am I doing zone two rides as an example? Why am I doing this or I'm only going to do an hour race? The, the adaptations you get from adding volume at a lower intensity is going to assist you uh, in those higher intensity efforts. So definitely, definitely. I can't get much more specific than that because it depends what your training looks like, the approach you're taking. Uh, if you're focused solely on crits, do long rides benefit? Well, this is like the same question. Do long rides benefit much, e.g. 46 hours, or are you better off doing as much shorter high intensity as you can handle? Um, yeah, you're gonna get diminishing returns from, you know, if you're only doing crits and you don't really care about anything else, you probably don't need to be doing rides over four hours, um, you know, but there's definitely benefit from doing longer, more aerobic, lower intensity rides and, and adding overload and volume to your week that way. Yes, yes, there is benefit to them. As a former rower, did you train both sports together? Uh, yes, I was. Oh, really? I did when I was rowing. I did some cycling and cross training. Do you see a place for cross training, e.g., rowing, in a training program in terms of ultimate benefit to go faster on the bike? Uh, no. No. Uh, in the off season, you know, or pre season, if you want to do some rowing or some running, but no. Essentially, the short answer is no. It's not going to do that much for you. You're better off just. From you're better off spending more time on the bike. Uh, what about someone who's got no rowing, like back? Someone like me, would I see any? It would even be even with more worse. useless for you because you'd be right. you'd be falling apart after t ten minutes on the erg, and you're not gonna. It's gonna be all sore. It's probably potentially I mean, even I'm cool. like, yeah. you probably you know you're better off doing some running, but even then, it's not gonna do that much for your cycling fitness. Mm. No, I don't. You know, and you see pros as well. I mean, they don't do that much cross training, really. You know, maybe in November and December you see them do a bit, but then they're just on the bike. Uh, Can I just make an announcement? Of course. I think we're in South Australia. Wow. Yep. Hello. Here we are. Live. South Australia. Did everyone just notice that we just got half an hour slower or faster? I can't remember which one it is. No, it's faster, isn't it? Yeah, you would. No, would. Half an hour. In Australia, we have a half an hour time difference between states. Is that the only place in the world that has a half an hour time difference? It's just so weird. I didn't even know there was a time difference. Yeah, half an hour. Uh, an hour. Half an hour. What's your and Chris's favourite item of rapper casual wear? Uh, okay, got yeah, mine's I, back I really like the shorts. So the randonnée shorts, and they don't do them anymore, but the commuter shorts, I find the cut, the cut of the shorts are designed for a cyclist legs, which is skinnier. So they fit, the wrapper shorts fit really well. Whereas I find them, if you go to just like a, a fashion store and you buy shorts, they're either too tight or they, they don't fit very well. So I'm a big fan of any of the, any of the casual shorts I really like, it's my pick. That gray um, mountain bike range trail sort of, jackety thing that I run, that's my favourite. Yeah, um, I see you wear that a lot. Yeah, I wear that yeah. heaps. Like, walking the kids around, like it's just the perfect, I'm just popping in a backpack, it's always with me, in fact it's back there. Um, yeah, run it all the time. Nice. What are your thoughts on yesterday's race and would you pick that only a handful of riders would have finished? Yes. Yeah, we've covered this a bit. Yes, we did say like, less um, well to a team's uh, having numbers is going to be more of an uncontrolled race. So yeah, we did we did say that in the team meeting the night before that it was going to be more unpredictable. Watch the upcoming race vlog. Yeah. Um, okay, so one more question, then I'm going to refresh and see if any more have come through recently. Will you try weight training this year? Why or why not? Uh, yes, I did a video saying I was getting back into weight training. I've actually since then quit the gym. A couple of reasons. They uh, let you quit the gym? Yeah, I left. Yeah. Uh, you have to pay like they stitch you up. It's like, oh, you got to pay that. your next four weeks. Yeah. It's like, yeah. Um, I started getting a sore back again, and I was also finding it. 
I just, with work and stuff, I don't have that much time to train. So I'm going to get more benefits from spending more time on the bike as opposed to spending, swapping hours that I could be spending on the bike for the gym is not worth the payoff for me. So I, I, I'm not going to be doing much. I would, I would definitely, uh, yeah, uh, at least once a week, once a week at least. It'll just be normally once a week unless it's a really wet week. Um, for me, yeah, it's about maintaining some just overall strength as an older human. Uh, I think that's important rather than it being like suddenly adding watts to my sprint. I think it's just maintenance of old aches and bones. Yeah. All right, I'm going to scroll up and refresh. Hope we got reception. Okay, one more has come through. Favorite podcast to listen to while cycling. We've covered the cycling ones, uh, a couple of other ones. You're a podcast man, though. I am. I, I like some of the some of the Joe Rogan ones are good. I also listen to like pop culture ones that are like designed for women. Like <laughs> I listen to like the the Mamma Mia ones because I I don't keep up to date with any of that stuff, and I. I find it interesting to keep up to date with that sort of side of things, the sort of celebrity, pop culture. I will also say more socially liberals is the right word, right mm-hmm. word. like keep up to date with that side of things. And then Joe Rogan balances it out. <laughs> um, so yeah, and I, I find the, the, term yeah, the, more, the more woke stuff. So yeah, I find they pass the time pretty well. Um, actually, yeah, a lot of the time on the bike, I'm not listening to cycling podcast that often you get into so i'm uh yeah you uh, you'll see my hobbies in this you'll definitely see uh 538 politics which is u.s politics based one and you'll see complex sneakers because that's another of my hobbies and uh yeah the uh, hoop collective is my third one and heaps of tech ones as well so the wire um mk mk bhd i'll listen to him yeah, lots of tech ones. All right, uh, intermission here. That's all the questions, but I only uploaded that video asking for questions this morning. So quick pause and we'll catch you in a bit. Okay, we're back. Um, we've got a bit of a situation on my white t-shirt. I slopped <laughs> my teriyaki noodles in, hoovered them up like a 10 year old. And now I've got all this. So hopefully most of you guys by this stage are just listening and not watching because this is I would change my shirt if I could get to my suitcase. I actually can't believe how quickly you ate that bucket. I didn't noodles. finish it. Oh, I you didn't, didn't finish it. No, I... Holy hell! Yeah, that was, that was an actual bucket. Full bucket of hokey noodles. Shout to uh, walk on. What was it? Walk, walk in a box. Walk in a box. Walk in a box. At the OTR. Beautiful. Just talon bend. Beautiful. Fantastic. Stay in the right lane. Staying in the right lane. Can we mute, no worries, can we mute her? Uh, we mute yep. Her? Oh, good. Chris is going to mute her, and I'm going to bring up the next questions. So, and mute. Okay, next question, Jesse. Your sugar water connection has been a game changer for me. Ooh. It now feels like I'm getting enough calories in for longer rides. Awesome. Very good. My question is: Should one also be adding salt to the mixture? Maybe or maybe adding potassium too. Uh, yes. If it's a hot day and you're sweating a lot, you would want to be taking in electrolytes with your carbs and fluids. So whether that's, you can you can use literal table salt if you want, or you can use an electrolyte product which has, um, as you said, a mix of different salts like potassium and magnesium and stuff. I'm not gonna go into the weeds on that, but yes, yeah, so you should be using some electrolytes with your sugar water. Definitely. Anything? anything to add on? Uh, no. No? No. I think you've mentioned this sometimes in your videos with the, the sugar in the past that it's the only downside of it is to be using it as your hydration on hot days. You do go through it really quickly. Mm. And that's where you, you manage to run those massive big bottles mm-hmm. for people with small frames, like physically small frames. It's actually hard to do that. So, mm. yeah. Mm-hmm. I add quite a bit of electrolyte. Thoughts on cycling holidays? What would you? What would be your dream tour? Uh, me personally, a cycling holiday sounds not very fun. I'd rather just go on holidays and drink beers at the beach. Cycling's not really a holiday. 
Covered this. That's my personal. I'm not. I'm not against cycling holidays. I just if I'm going away, I don't want to bring my bike. Chris, you? Uh, yeah. Look, if you're going going with mates, uh, back in the day, the old two and an under trip was always a cracker. Uh, Location wise, I have to say, I think Bright is got to be a pick of the bunch in terms of sort of eastern seaboard side type stuff. Um, because there's lots for the family. Well, lots for the family. There's quite a bit for the families to do with the, the lake and walks and it's just a really nice town to be around. Um, was it a location question or just Yeah, generic? Well, what would be your dream tour on a cycling holiday? Dream tour. See, I wouldn't do the whole go to the tour de France thing. Like, I just think that's an absolute punish. Or, like, it's just a logistic nightmare. I went to the Giro with some mates a good few years ago. That was really good because it's super easy to get around. The Giro just has way less, like, faff going on. Oh, it's 80, not 60 here, Chris. No wonder everyone's going past me. Um, yeah, so the Giro worked really well. Um, so that was actually the last week of the Giro. I'd, I'd definitely recommend that as a cycling holiday if you want to try and time it with doing some of the riding as well. And a dream location? wouldn't mind going to sort of Colorado again, but skiing. Oh, riding in Colorado do some of the stuff around Aspen that area yeah I was going to say something sim- like when we when I stayed in Park City training for the Tour of Utah like to go there but if I was going to do it I would like to bring like a gravel bike and a mountain bike so yeah I guess if I was going to do a cycling holiday I would pick like a multi-discipline place and mix it up and then going somewhere and just doing road rides yeah maybe not for me um Bree Clail hey Bree uh, how do you manage pee stops in the convoy at Road Nats? Good question. Do you have a pee bottle? No, we don't have a pee bottle. It'd be a bit gross. Um, so we held it in for like. Are we talking about driving or riding yeah, in the convoy? I just held it in. We held it in, but then eventually, when we had time, you, we you can we pull over quickly, go to the toilet. And it was then, a portal. It was actually a portal. Yeah. I'll point that out. And then you just you just drive really fast to get back onto the to the convoy again. Because, um, you know, the race isn't, you know, you can always drive to catch up. And if you, you stop for a minute or two, you can close that gap pretty easily in the car. So, yeah, just pull over if you need to. Um, every, every car in the convoy has an order. So, thankfully, we were second in the convoy order. So, that means we, when we then caught up to the, to the back of the convoy again, we could just go past everyone and slot in in the second slot. So, yeah, you just pull over. Again, watch upcoming toilet. race vlog for updates on how Chris and Jesse managed their bladders <laughs> throughout that tour. That's oh, I have heard stories of the pee bottle, <laughs> Bree. Yes, it is done. It is done. Not training, but a resting question. I'm a 63 year old runner and cyclist and suck at both. <laughs> uh, wondering what is the rest slash active recovery strategy that you use for pure cyclists? Or these are those doing both. Great show, guys. Thanks. Um, okay, so um, rest or active recovery. I, I'm okay. I got an opinion on pretty strong opinion on this one. So I'm. I think active recovery can be good. So doing like a short recovery ride or like a walk on a rest day is good. But it gets to a point where there's some riders I see and they will never have a day off the bike because. They don't like how they feel the day after a rest day. So they're always riding and you're looking back in their training, it's weeks, weeks and months and months and months and they have not had a day off the bike. And I don't think that's good. So I think active uh, uh, recovery ride on a day where you want to be, you're going out for a hard session the next day, I think can be good. But you should be having a day off. For most people, you should be having a day off once once a week or once a fortnight. Don't become addicted to recovery rides. I don't think that's productive. Um, that's my take on them. I would, you know, kidding. Person, my personal opinion though, I don't really like kidding, getting in kit and going through that whole process to go and ride for 45 minutes to an hour at 100 yeah, watts. Same. I'd rather just go for a walk or something. Um, Chris, what is your? I just, just can't be bothered with recovery rides. Mm. If, that, if that's what we're talking about, like, yeah. I just can't be bothered. Like you can't. Can't be bothered putting. Yes, I know it does probably mean that the next day doesn't feel as good, but in the grand scheme of things, longer warm up you can mitigate most yeah. of it. Can't you? Yeah. 
I mean, look, I'll admit that I'm certainly addicted to, to, to doing something every day, but it will be, yeah, I'd like to do something else. I'm flirting with the idea of swimming. Uh, oh. Be careful. <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. Swimming. Swimming. Yeah, where, well, where like, are you going to swim? Well, okay, so, so Catherine's going to do some swim lessons and stuff at Leichhardt Pool, and I'm like, you know what, I'm like, to sort of just go along, take the speedos with me, the budgies. Oh my god! Take the take the bo- the, the goggles. PSA: Like up, Paul. Pound, cancel your some laps, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. I tell ya, it's uh, you were not going to do wait, that. Wait, two no days ago you were talking that. about doing an Ironman. So. No, I wasn't. That was my girlfriend trying to tell me how to do one. No, you, I will. Oh, I right. will ride. I will swim laps. Do we get a training a day in the day, day, a training day. vlog from Chris on his <laughs> like up pool? It'll be won't be safe for, for children because <laughs> there will be speedos worn oh at some point. God. I actually don't mind swimming. I've forgotten that I actually quite like swimming. So yeah, uh, it's I can't swim for long. That's the other good thing. I can only do like about ten laps, and I'm. You probably would bed. feel good after a swim. I'd say yeah, that. I'd get out of the pool. You do. Like, yeah. I'd prefer to do that than like a walk. That's my point. Yeah. Like, or let a, a God forbid, a jog. <laughs> so, yeah. I don't know. Get the, get the coconut oil out. Uh, <laughs> how would you structure the training of a beginner who wants to, who has a low FTP and wants to be a climber, rode casually for the past year and want to take on structured training to improve fitness? Uh, that's literally impossible to answer. There's like, there's infinite number of ways that you could structure your training, depending on so many things. I can't really, you know, I can't really answer that one. Do you recommend eight to 12 week FTP builder style programs offered by Zwift and System? So Wahoo System there. Are they effective in your view? Uh, you know, they probably are. From, I would say for most riders, if you did one and you stuck to it, you, I would be surprised if you didn't improve, because um, it's just eight to twelve weeks. You know, is that a is that a good way to improve long term? We're talking months and years, probably not, because then you're always just doing these little blocks. You're probably not seeing much progression over a longer period of time. Uh, other thing with that is you're probably then stuck on the trainer. So then, how are you? The problem with these this is the thing. The problem with these things is. Suddenly you then want to go outside one day on the weekend and your whole program's screwed because that can't factor that in. And then you're like, well, oh, if I, but if I want to ride with my mates on a Saturday, well, then what do I do? So you end up, unless you, you don't ride with anyone and you only ride on the trainer, you'll definitely, you'll, yeah, you'll almost guaranteed to see improvement because you're doing a good, usually they're overloaded pretty in a structured way, you'll probably see improvement. But, you know, do I recommend them? No, because of those reasons. They're hard to fit in with other riding, Long term, your progression's stuck, and then you kind of you're not learning anything. All you're doing is getting, you know, you're getting a bit fitter, but you're probably not learning much, and you're probably ending finishing it with a thousand different questions that you're not going to get answered. Um, but there's a place for them. I mean, that's the first the, when I first did my, the first training I did for cycling was a it was actually a Strava training plan. Oh, yeah. I was like loaded up, yep. and you know, I just started doing sessions. Um, and it was, yeah, no, it was good. Let's get the foot in. Uh, what is better, road bikes or mountain bikes? Oh, hold on, hold on. What is better, road bikes or mountain bikes? And road ri- and road bike riders or mountain bike riders? Road bikes or mountain uh, Helicopters. Road bikes or mountain bikes? Well, we, yeah, we don't Green. really mountain bike. Green. Um, mountain bikers are... Uh, Overall, more friendly than roadies, I'd say. Yes, I pick road bikes, but be a mountain, be a mountain biker, be Cam Ivory, be a mountain biker yeah. on a road bike. Yeah, I turned up to that wild mountain bike park the other week with Aaron, and it's just all mountain bike people there, and like five people just said hello to me. Like you wouldn't turn up to a road event and have people saying hello and how's your day. It was very friendly, and I was not comfortable at all. Uh, yeah. But yeah, uh, what about do do mountain bikers become mountain bikers become good road bikers? Road bikers don't really become good mountain bikers. No, definitely no. not. No. 
So if you're going to start somewhere, start mountain biking, oh, yeah. and then you could be good at both, don't start road biking because you can't be good at mountain biking. Because you'll suck at anything else in life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Why has the council never resurfaced Heffron? So Heffron is Heffron Park, which is a local criterium track in Sydney, which is made up of concrete slabs. They're a bit rough. So why has it never been resurfaced? Or is it a legacy thing where the race organisers don't want to resurface it to lose the charm of it? Every year, there's like a story that pops up that the council's going to resurface it. And since I've been racing there, it's never actually happened. I've heard... So I've heard uh, urban myths about this, right? That the, there's two reasons. The first is that because Maroubra and all that's all sand, right, that to actually redo it, they'd have to just dig the whole thing up and redo the, like, the whole circuit. You wouldn't just be able to, like, nicely resurface it. You've got to dig the other thing up. The other old wives' tale that I've heard is that, like, there was some sort of World War II, like, bunker or something underneath it, and it's, like, military-grade concrete that would be impossible to bash Correct Jesse in the comments down below, wow. but that's that's Things an old wise tale I heard. A um, couple of things, uh, two cents on this is, I don't think the surface is that bad. That's because you're race on 20 it kilos no, heavier than yeah. me. Yeah. I don't have any issue with it, really. It's not, I don't think it's dangerous. No, it's not dangerous. It's a bit rough, but it's not people yeah. like, oh, look at the cracks. It's not dangerous. It's fine. Uh, and I think it would actually be more dangerous. If you, if you put hot mix on that, like, it's not, mm. oh, I feel like... That'd be... It had turned into a bit more like that race up in Brisbane. The... Um, uh, Muzz. You know, it's I've a similar type there. of course, but it's... Yes, you have. Oh, that's got no corners in it. That's like a... That's almost an oval. Muzz. The yeah, one that's sort of Brisbane width. crit is. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's width, but okay. Heffron has corners. I think we're crossing the Murray River. Oh, yeah? There you go. Um, Murray River. No, I think keep it out. I like it how it is. Oh, I th- I, yeah, I'm not for changing it and just telling it. It'll probably happen. But, you know, it'll obviously happen eventually. Uh, actually, the most dangerous thing they ever did was they cut back the grass on the side of the track oh, yeah. uh, maybe maybe a year ago, and then it left these huge gaping holes off the side of the concrete and riders' yeah. wheels were slipping in there. That was yeah. dumb. That was really dumb. Uh, what would you want between the two? Top-of-the-line wheels that are aero and light... Or a top of the line custom skin suit. Oh, okay. Oh, uh, wheels. Wheels, yeah. Because you could just buy, you could just wear tight kits, pretty aero, aero enough. Wheels. But wheels, super light. Imagine if you had, imagine if you had eighty mil wheels that were like the weight of a of a C twenty five Shimano tub. Can I guess that the residency of the person who asked that question is somewhere in the United Kingdom? You guys are obsessed with your aero, like, kit. Do you have any tips on finding your race weight? Finding it? Yeah. What do you mean? Find what you've looked your optimal stuck race Stuck behind weight the door, or...? Oh, right. Okay. Ah, oh, that's a good question. Hmm. Hmm. That's a really good question. Trial and error. Try... Yeah. I... I... Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. I, yeah, and for, for me, I discovered what was too light. Uh, actually, at nationals, the first time I ever did it, and I got horrendously sick. I was like s- almost sixty kilos, uh, and I did like a really good hard training session the week before it and then three days later got a cold and a cough and couldn't throw it for like two months Uh, and I just felt a lot of that was due to being too light Uh, and I think too heavy was a little bit easier for me to work out because I realized basically what power I could do and to maintain you know, a position in a race at a certain power, I kind of have to be around a certain weight, really. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've uh, I've never been too light. Like, I've got down to sort of 74 and been fit, and that was that was good. I was riding really well. I was actually 
the Roman. tour of Brisbane last year and then Roman. the race got cancelled. Um, so, but I've never really tried to push it any further because I don't really see the point. Thankfully, yeah, I haven't had to go. Th- like, I think, feel like I'll, at, at the top level of the sport, at least domestically, a lot of riders have gone through that p- phase of losing too much weight and then they ride like crap. And so, I mean, I don't know. I don't really have any advice on that. Just, I don't know. Sure. What yeah. about too heavy, though? When did you discover well, question, you were too heavy? Well, you, well, you know you're too heavy when you're eating more, when you just, I don't know. What do you yeah. mean? Like, you're heavier than you need to. Oh. I, I know I can race, be really good at 74, 75. If I'm 77, I know I'm, I could lose a few kilos. Mm-hmm. I don't know. It doesn't need to be. Sorry, there's not really any tips there. Just don't, I don't know. How to find your right race weight, yeah. Well, it'll naturally, you'll, you know, if you're looking fit and you don't have, you're not eating crap and you're, you know, fairly lean, it's probably about right. It's not going to be much off. It's not like you're suddenly going to be able to lose five kilos mm. like I don't know I don't think that's really yeah rate how hard the road nats fun, fondo was laps were compared to the like men's race uh, time I haven't looked at the times we were doing like 640 Buninyong hill climbs and I, I'm pretty sure the elite race goes way faster than that so I don't know I don't think it was really hard because I'm not that fit. Well, for me, it was really hard because I'm not that fit at the moment, but you can't. The elite race was faster. Uh, yeah. Anything on that, Chris? Uh, well, we only did five laps, but I think I said this earlier, that the full laps I was doing as fast as I've done in the elite race because they were, the whole lap was being raced as opposed to sometimes what happens in the elite race is that the climb is unbelievable and then there's a bit of a sit up through the through other parts of the race, whereas that didn't happen in the, the Masters version, which was fantastic. It was incredibly hard. Like, I came ninth. Like, yeah, and I was bloody lucky to be there. Uh, okay, next. How many clients slash athletes do you coach? Um, should I answer this? I don't know any coaches that wouldn't answer this. Would or wouldn't? Would. I don't think you need to answer that. Uh, all right, I'll answer. Uh, I don't mind. Uh, well, it's a bit. It's a bit different because I only, I've only been coaching full time since the start of this year, uh, because before that I was working um, at Today's Plan doing a few other jobs. So I mean, I'll, I don't mind answering. I coach at the moment forty two riders, um, and I. It's still growing, and I'm, there's still room to grow. But it's the only thing, it's the only thing I'm doing, um, full-time job. So it's going to continue to grow, I think, and getting a lot of inquiries. So there we go, I answered it. And yeah, moving on. Hardest club crit in the country. Oh, well, I don't know. I don't really know because I haven't raced them, but uh, the Ad- the Vic Park crits at Adelaide when the Australian track team riders all show up, I, that's he's, you've got to say that's hands down the hardest because they you know, when those guys are training in big training blocks, they go down to the local crit in Adelaide and just destroy it. So I'd, you know, that'd, when those guys are racing, that's easily the hardest crit in Australia, I'd have to say. Have you done any circuits outside of Sydney? Uh, not local. I thought the Narang one at Gold Coast was probably the best circuit I ever did in Australia. Uh, Canberra Cycling Club? <laughs> Sorry, no. Randwick Cycling Club? <laughs> no, no. They are definitely... No. Um, if you could add a second professional team from Australia, what category would you put them in? Pro or World Tour? Well, definitely World Tour. How would you... Yeah. Yeah, you definitely. If Australia was going to have another pro con, uh, pro conti or world tour team, you you put them in world tour. Oh, well, you could argue having a uh, having a yeah. have a pro conti team that actually took more Australian riders would be good. Yeah, well, and you'd have to base it in Europe. Like, there's no point having a I don't think a pro conti team based in Australia because there's there's not enough racing, so it has to be based in Europe. 
Yeah, but you would you could have it Australian registered. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, maybe there's value to the <coughs> Pro Conti team then. Yeah. But then is it a development for the hmm, and if so, who are some riders you would sign to that team? Now, I don't know. Can we skip that one? I think we're going to skip that. Who is some... Oh. Yeah, I don't know. Hey, Jesse, love the videos. Keep... That's great, man. Thanks. Uh, what are your thoughts on doing interval sessions with numbers... With zones worked out based on aspirational FTP numbers? Uh, well, Coming from a rowing background as well, there was a training philosophy whereby you would have a target boat speed that you would try and hold for as long as possible. Mm. Yeah, okay. Over time, you would hopefully be able to hold that speed for longer. Okay, I see what you mean. I'm not sure how much merit this has based with cycling and whether training session would be too high. Um, so that's kind of like a really, a very basic old school sort of thing, idea so of training. So that's like if it's you like, ride, if I want my... FTP to be 330. I'm going to ride at 330 for as long yeah. as I can. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, yeah. let's hear this. Well, you, there's you, you will get fitter doing that. But if that that's not, <laughs> that's maybe one or two sessions a week you might do mm -hmm. for that thing. That's not a training program. So no, I don't think I don't think that that's not a good training philosophy. It's a good idea to have in your back of the head of like, oh, I want to I want to have a 330 FTP, so I'm going to build up to that. But the way you build fitness is by you know doing work above that and doing work far below that. Like in rowing, you're not going to go and just do you know one k one k pieces at your target boat speed. No, you go and do ten k rows and you do twenty k rows and you build. You know, the training has to is holistic. So I don't like I like that idea in terms of a goal, but I don't think you know, especially in cycling. cycling. Yeah. Ah. Uh, what are your thoughts on doing interval sessions with zones worked out based on aspirational FTP numbers? Okay, no, I don't like that. You don't set your FTP, that's not a good way to, don't set your FTP higher than it is and then try and do sessions. Like, just set your FTP at what it is and then the sessions should just be hard enough. You know, that's what, training is all relative to your current fitness level, you know. And then you might go and do like four 10-minute efforts at your target FTP. You know, that's fine, but... Yeah, I don't think I have much more else to say on that. It's not really a training philosophy. That's just a, a way to structure sessions slightly, you know, at a slightly higher intensity, which is fine. Uh, yeah. Any advice for staying safe from cars on Australian roads while riding? I'm enjoying riding out on the road, but I have a definite sense of fear slash dread by cars rushing by. That's a hard one because it depends where. Like, depends like where, it depends roads. what kind of... Mate, the, on this highway, you would ride very differently to what... So we're on a two-lane highway here, and the first one of the first things I was going to say is, in comparison to Europe, try and be a bit more dominant on the road in the sense that sometimes you do need to take a lane to feel to feel safe because then a car has to park pass you properly. Whereas, no, I'm not going to say to you on this two-lane highway, take a lane and have a 110k car run up the back side of you so it does very much change from road to road if you've got a nice shoulder to use that shoulder definitely um, and how to feel more safe for me a lot of it comes down to just being a, sometimes a bit more assertive um, because Australian drivers don't tend to be used to cyclists and, and what a cyclist is going to do. So sometimes the more that you signal or the more that you make it clear that you're, you have space, the better. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. Um, I, oh, one thing I will say, I don't wave cars past me. So when I'm riding down in Berry and it's just single lane, no shoulders, like, I won't do the, oh, come past me now, it's all clear. Um, I find that that's just a recipe for disaster because obviously you can wave and then the next thing you know, a car comes the other way and it's you've put yourself in this position. Um, yeah. I, do, I do ride with front and rear lights during the day as well. Yeah, that's a good... I, I don't really have any advice, but I do find 
if I feel like I'm visible, I'm more confident and makes me more relaxed. So I uh, run a rear, a very bright rear light, and then try and have like visible kit. Just makes me feel safer, even if it makes not much difference. And I feel like if if you're if you're driving and you're approaching a cyclist and it looks like they've gone to an effort to make themselves visible, okay. you might be more likely to give room. Whereas if it's just someone yeah. riding in like black kit and a black helmet and no light, yeah. the driver's like, well, this guy doesn't care about his safety. Yeah. I feel like maybe that helps. Yeah. Um, and if you if you are on country roads, buy a Varia radar, the Garmin Varia. I would. I don't have one because I ride around the city, but you know, like on those roads in Ballarat, I'd be um. I would buy one in a heartbeat if I was going and riding there. Do you, would you ride in the shoulder? Like if you're on a single lane each way, you know what I mean? And yeah. it's one of those roads. I'd, I'd, I'd no, go in the shoulder. But, yeah. If there's enough to ride in there, I'll go in there. Yeah. You're just less likely. To get, people are... Yeah. You, I agree. You're just less likely to get a close pass if you're in the shoulder. Mm. That's just... You know, how it is. And I... Yeah, that feeling of sitting out. If there's a little shoulder and you decide to ride in the lane, that feeling of sitting there just being like, oh, God, this next... Yeah, you know, that's just a horrible feeling. So you, you know, keep out of the way as much as possible, I reckon. I find myself... I much, I feel much safer riding around Sydney than I do on country roads, just for that reason. Yeah. That city drivers tend to be more, like, engaged with what's happening around them. Yeah. Mm. Frame size, you guys prefer to ride down a size or up a size? Uh, I'm personally definitely down a size, so I run a 56 frame, I could probably run a 58, but I prefer the 56 with the 130 stem. Why? Uh, I think they handle, they more, they're more, twi- a smaller frame twitchy, feels twitchier and feels more agile when you're riding it. Bigger frame you kind of like, you kind of feel like you're driving a bus, whereas if it's downsized, you sort of feel like you're in a sports car. It's probably yeah. the best way to put it. Yeah. Even if the bike fits similar. Um, yeah, I'm sort of the same. I tend to run a little bit smaller, but then I sit right on, like, my frame size, if that makes sense. Like, I'm I'm pretty much a small er- everywhere, so it's, it's not a big question for me. Um... Oh, and the other thing is like, especially if you're buying a bike secondhand, you can always make a bike bigger by like running a really high seat post and a long stem. Whereas if you buy a bike that's too big, you can't really do anything about it. Like you're always gonna, if it's too big for you, you can't do anything about it. So keep that in mind as well, I reckon. Uh, okay, last one. And this one comes in while we're answering this. Thoughts on regular people out riding Wearing a protein kit. All for it. All for it. 100%. Get involved. Not national champs jerseys, uh, but protein kits. Love to be able to offer you the Nero kit at some point this year. Make sure you email Rafa to tell them to do that because uh, we'd love to be able to have guys out riding our kit as well. What do you uh, think? Yeah, I'm, I don't see a problem with it. It's cool. I'd, I would think it would be freaking awesome if we were out riding and saw someone else in Nero kit having yeah. purchased it. I reckon that'd be sick. Um, not that Nero's a pro kit, but you know what I mean. I think it's all, I'm all for it. And it like helps, it's just a way to support, if you're like a pro team and you wear their kit, you're just supporting them. I don't have any problem. I don't think people, I think, I feel like people think people have a problem with it, but mm. I don't know many people that are, that are, are against it. I yeah. think that's a misnomer. Yeah. Yeah, it's the, it is, I think it's a hanger of the national kit thing because maybe sometimes when you win the Nash so who's who's um, so Luke Luke Plath will have the he'll have an Australian Ineos jersey now won't he yep so my thing there would be no that's not a jersey that you buy mm. Ineos jersey go nuts don't know why you'd want to buy it but yeah absolutely go buy that jersey but not the national champs version of it yeah yeah um, that is all the questions we got. Uh, so yeah, thanks for listening and watching if you've been watching us this entire time. Do you want to uh, give a shout to anyone in Adelaide this week? If we're here? No, no, that means we have to ride with people. I know, if they just see us, shout at us. Uh, yeah. Abuse us, tell us to get off the road. Uh, yeah, give us a shout if you see us around in Adelaide on the road. Other than that, 
we will end it there. See you guys.